you know good and well, you might as well get some water, dog. <laughs> No. I'm gonna milk this door for all I can. <laughs> you need yeah. more. Yeah, you need some That's snacks. Stuff, bro. Right yeah. now. This one. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I was already told at the top of the show, <laughs> make this quick. Nah. <laughs> anyway. Straight up. Nah, fuck quick on this one. <laughs> we going all in. right, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is another episode of Quest Love Supreme. Uh, Supreme, how are you guys? That's nice. Yeah, anyway. Uh -huh. <laughs> Fantastic. You know, if you know me, uh, based on the show, you you know there's a, a particular type of interview that I that we all love to nerd out on, and this is no exception. Um, I, I guess today, you know, he is a former super executive, uh, chairman and CEO of Epic Records, former uh, chairman and CEO of Def Jam. Uh, Former president and CEO of Arista, um, and also his own uh, LaFace imprint, Ooh. LaFace Records. Sure. Um, not to mention, oh, former award-winning uh, songwriter and and producer, and former drummer, and probably the most moisturized <laughs> of all time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's important. <laughs> uh, not, not to mention, I mean, look, y'all know me. It's gonna take forty-five minutes once I start reading off the accolades. Look, you, you already know it, man. Like you literally know it. Two occasions, this guy, a girlfriend, this guy, Roni, rock with you. Don't be cruel. This Ooh, guy, ah, into the road, this guy. Oh, yeah. Uh, Love should have brought you home last night. Ooh, this guy. Yeah. Not to mention the Axie sign. Name him Tony Braxton, Damian Ooh. Damn, Goody Mom, Jer Jermaine Jackson, Usher, Ooh. Outcast. Ooh. I, I can name them all. Ladies and gentlemen, we finally have him. I feel like this is the sequel to the baby face episode. It Please is. Yeah. Nah, yeah, this is the, the baby face, the baby safe episode. That was breaking bad. This is better call Saul. Exactly. <laughs> there you go. Literally, yo, this this guy is so legend that he even dropped me from the label and took me back <laughs> on my birthday. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Yo, I got dropped the morning of my birthday and came Yo. back the night of my birthday. <laughs> That's gonna be a long one. Yeah, <laughs> Look, he sweat out. Yo, dog, you know I'm playing with you. Please welcome L.A. Reed to cross up some y'all. Thank you, thank you. Welcome. Yes. <laughs> oh my God. Yes. By the way, that's inaccurate, but go on. <laughs> well, you know how dramatic Richard Nichols was, so maybe Rich was just using a Jedi mind trick on me to get the album done. <laughs> Ooh, so possible. Right. Rich yeah. woke okay. me up for my birthday at six in the morning, like, Amir, the roots just got dropped off Def Jam. I, I, I was like, no. Literally, I was all depressed. And then, like... Oh, I, I think we met, didn't we? I called you up, and I literally called you up and... I left a message. I was like, come on, dog. It's my birthday, man. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> my God. Uh, that's my favorite story of all. Look, every every artist has a, a CEO executive story. And I'm glad that's my story because it could have been with you uh, hanging me out the window mm -hmm. of my ankles or something <laughs> or <laughs> or any any other unsavory CEO uh story uh how are you how you doing i'm good man i'm good i'm entertained already this is already fun so la uh where right now where are you speaking to us from i am in los angeles in the studio uh we have a studio in studio city and i'm uh i'm in i'm just i'm in the studio all right my, my favorite place uh are, dare we ask you uh what you're doing in the studio is this uh, top secret uh, no, you know, I'm, I'm always digging and, and just I love the idea of being around people. And I just have a lot of writing camps and um, some writers and producers come by, meet with people. I'm just always looking for music, you know. Um, but right now I'm actually working on Usher. Mm. Oh, okay. and it feels so good. Yeah, so it this, does. This is Camp Usher time. Yes, Camp Usher. That's right. Usher's tiny desk. 
uh, performance is probably uh, a, a pleasant, well-needed jolt uh, in the right direction of reminding people. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm also, I'd, I'm, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, the versus comedy hour also played a part. I missed it. You are. I heard best, about it. It was you the are. best comedy show in history. <laughs> Needless to say, we happy to hear there may be a Chris and Usher versus. That is uh, the dream. Four, five, five know. hours, six hours, seven hours. Yeah. I, I don't know, man. I, I think some. I, sometimes I think that. I think sometimes people should sit those out. That's my opinion. Like, I don't think that. I don't think they're for everybody. I think because. I, I don't know. I don't well, know. the way that it was. The way that it initially came to us, I wish it would have stayed there, which was mainly about like two producers like, yes, working on beats at the same time, you know, like the Buster and what Alchemist was the first one, or was it not the Buster Alchemist, the uh, Just uh, Blaze? Uh, Swizz and no, it was originally Swizz and Tim. Yeah. yeah. That was yeah. first? Yeah. That's how that's Even before Just up? Blaze and Alchemist? Yeah, I remember. If, if we talk about verses, how verses started. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I meant the 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 pre verses. The there uh, was like there was this thing where like Just Blaze and Alchemist would do this back and forth thing. You don't remember the the Buster Rhymes? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. The Buster Rhymes. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. But for me, I was kind of hoping that that was more the modus operandi where it wasn't about you know, winner take all. But I think, you know, once the pandemic started, people just wanted entertainment. And that mm-hmm. seemed like a logical way to keep people entertained, of course, with right. the best A-list talent. But eventually you're going to run out of A-list talent. Right. And then what do you do? Um, it was supposed to be the classics, too. It was supposed to be like up into, you know, a certain age kind of era range, I felt like, too. And they kinda, well, yeah. now I just think it's finding somebody that has had 10 to 15 notable hits. Right. Which is exactly. that 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 well is right. gonna run dry quickly. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And so <laughs> that's but actually any- really funny to me. <laughs> that's funny because I don't always like to to bring light to it, but the truth is we're hard pressed to find artists with 15 to 20 hits. Facts. That's hard. Yeah. It is. And those that have it aren't with us anymore. Right. And so the well is I mean, we're in we're in a place right now where it's diminished returns and, you know, you got to let people in the door. Like lately, I will say for my own group, you know, we've been having this sort of conversation with the powers that be at least the last five to six years. Like you have to let us in the door. Like who the hell? Okay, who the hell is left? You know what I mean? So it's sort of like I'm not saying that there was a begrudging all right come in you know like that sort of thing but um but who I, could battle y'all that's kind of hard that's hard anyway that's a we're not even built like that yeah but, that's you know, what i'm saying there is no this but groups. we we did we did get in we did get an offer once i, I guess i can yeah. mention it now yeah please tell everybody because you told please me. yeah well no it um the roots and goody mob had a versus on the table that we weren't able to do really okay. wow odd, odd pairing but you know I mean, and that is, I mean, I get it though. I actually get it. As odd as it is, I kind of get it. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I mean, but you, you know. guys don't have rivals. The truth is, you don't have rivals because mm-hmm. we don't live in an era of, first, there's no black bands, first of all. You're the only black band that in, in forever. Um, so you you would actually have to go back and battle like, like cameo or some shit. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I would have act- we we talked to uh our, our last episode was with Larry. Amazing episode, by the way. Oh, wow. Um, no, I I think probably if it were to come down to that, we probably would do like D'Angelo did, which is like have roots and a whole bunch of friends come by yeah, and yeah. do Ooh, something would- fun. Anyway, yo, we're, we're wasting time here. LA, oh. what was your very first musical memory? Shit. <laughs> first musical memory ever like yes. ever your first thought of music what like what's it might be it might be a little hazy but i think that it was growing up cincinnati ohio um in the kitchen small kitchen transistor radio in the window and 
I think it was, I think it was, it's my party and I cry if I want to. Less than four. Yes, I think it was that. Cause I, for some reason I remember that name Quincy Jones, don't know why, but like I knew that name as a baby and it yeah. never left, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it was that, or it was, or it was something from Motown, right? Okay. Like one of those dancing in the streets, or mm -hmm. uh, I, I can't exactly. Remember. I was very young, but um, the the one that the one that got me though, the one that like the life changing moment, yeah. was when I heard "Give the Drummer Some" and and "Cold Sweat" James Brown. That mm -hmm. moment, like yeah. that was that the world stopped. So speaking of. Cincinnati. Oh, by the way, uh, in case our listeners don't know, not many people know that Quincy Jones produced Leslie Gore's "It's My Party." That's his very first, very first hit. hit as as a as a pop song as a pop producer. Um, I was going to say that I I noticed at least from what Booty told me, um, and just from observing that anyone who's in proximity of King Records and their whole operation had their life changed, either as someone that works inside of King Records or the studio or the factory or someone like Bootsy Collins did hung in the alleyway and just hoped maybe one day we'll get used or something like that. Yep. But because there's a five year, a five to 10 year age discrepancy of you and Bootsy's generation. Right. How did the James Brown Ohio effect? And plus, this also explains why Ohio is the funk capital of the United States, because I mean, basically, King Records moved their operations to Cincinnati and mm -hmm. basically at a time period in which the ripple effect started happening, even in other cities like funk just spread throughout Dayton, Columbus, Cleveland right. and all over. So just as a 10 year old, were you aware of James Brown's presence in the city? Uh, I, I feel like I didn't know it officially, but I felt the presence. Like the first concert I ever went to was a James Brown concert at the Cincinnati Convention Center. And I hung outside and I met Maceo Parker. And that was, that was a big deal for me. Like literally walking down the street outside the convention center and also king records was um like a few doors down from like my karate school as a kid right so i would go to karate school but <laughs> and when i and wait on the bus right take, right take the bus home afterwards and i knew that that was king records so i never saw a soul but i would just stare at it i, I felt drawn to it um but then as i got like slightly older all the musicians in Cincinnati were all so impacted by Bootsy and James Brown, but more Bootsy, to be honest, right? James was like the godfather of soul, but Bootsy was our local superstar. So everything that Bootsy did, we all, you know, aspired to do. Bootsy holds his bass this way. So you hold your bass like Bootsy, right? Mm -hmm. Or Bootsy wears these kind of shoes, or he has these, everything was about Whatever boots he did was the magic, you know, and uh, he, he was like a god to us. James Brown needed Bootsy more than Bootsy needed James, even though Bootsy needed that. He needed the guidance. Uh, right. Uh, yeah. yeah know, James Brown needed that validation of, you know, the next generation respecting him. And uh, what was the first song? Super bad. Very uh, first song was Sex Machine. Sex Machine was Bootsy. Very first one. Yeah. OK. You got it. There's there's an amazing. All right. So they they, they did that song in two takes. And there's a, there's a really amazing. Uh, rare dialogue for James, like if you listen to James's outtakes. Normally, it's sarcasm or I mean, not like mean spirited, but like if they mess up or whatever. You'll 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 hear him like chastise the engineer or something like that. But um, when they do the second take of Sex Machine. There's like a 45 minute conversation of James just like, you hear him walking in the studio and tell them like, like being encouraging almost, right. like, which is rare for James Brown, but he's like, obviously knows like these these six, 17, 
18 year old kids are really, really scared right now. And he's just, oh, no, you got it, man. Like, you, you can do it. And da, 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 da. like, which is, oh, wow. Compared to the rest of what James does, like on the other takes or whatnot, like, it's almost like he knew that he was dealing with children. You know what I mean? Right. And so he had some sensitivity. And, and, and he exactly. was, yeah, that's great. And they used the first take anyway. So like the very first take was the, the version that we know. Wow. So you're a drummer. Well, sort first of. of all, tell us no, about you're, that. you're a drummer. Mm. I, I play the drums. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Well, first of all, your, 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 your home situation, what, what was your, uh, your domestic home situation then? Like, was your family musically inclined, your parents? In my immediate family, meaning my mother, my sisters, um, we had a stepfather there. I never knew my father, but we had a stepfather there uh, uh, occasionally. Uh -huh. He was there. I'm being mean. He was there. Um, okay. But they played music because they had poker games all the time. Right. So they always played music and it was always kind of a, the weekends were festive. And uh, eventually I became like the guy to play the records at a very Ooh. young age. Right. Yeah. And and I could play what I wanted to play. You know, so I played Sly and Family Stone or I played what? War or I played, you know, whatever I wanted to listen to at the time. Um, and James Brown and you know uh, king floyd i remember that song uh, was it a situation where you where they said let me see what you got and the first no, time you played a good no, record no no it's just like the record player would stop and they, uh -huh. and they're all and they're all into the game so i just walk over and play what i wanted to play and no one said anything okay so question um for them the, for that music and at that time um would that be the equivalent of say like my nephew or my god kids putting trap music on when say the adults in the room want to hear mm -hmm. something older? Yeah, like more Ray Charles. So like, yeah, they love music? Bobby. You so right. they love Bobby Womack. They just like, you know, Communications album. I think it was like they right. they like they like things that felt more like the blues, okay, more soul blues, mm -hmm. and and funk was the music of the kids. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Were your people and, from and, Ohio? Your people from Ohio? Like yeah, everybody's from Ohio. Yeah. Wow. So I have an uncle. I had an uncle. He passed away, and he's a drummer. But he is a jazz drummer, right? And I remember him taking me to jam sessions with him when I was very, very young. And he set up a set of drums in his uh, in his apartment. And I would, and you know, he lived in an apartment, so you couldn't like you couldn't really play. So I was just playing with my fingers, but I was playing James Brown mm -hmm. at the best I could. And he was like, "That's not music. That's oh. not music. Yeah, that's not music. Jazz guy. Yeah. yeah, jazz guy. Like that's not music." <laughs> I was like, "Okay, I got it." So I knew early on, like, okay, I see, I see what the purists are thinking here, you know. Versus, we that was commercial. James Brown was commercial, you know. Uh, Hey, hey, by the way, you're a music, you're a real musicologist. Can I ask you a question? So did, did Miles Davis no who ripped off who? Uh, so what? Yo, Miles, so what? Miles was first. Pee-wee, uh Pee-wee, Miles is uh, uh Pee-wee, James Brown's uh Pee-wee uh Ellis. Yes. Yeah, went on record to say that. You know, all those and actually all those guys thought alongside your uncle as in I'm a jazz musician, but let me just make some money on the side and play this pop stuff that I don't care about. And right. then I'll have a jazz career. And basically, Pee Wee Ellis would basically steal jazz arrangements that he liked and incorporate in James Brown. So the whole cold sweat da -da, da -da, uh -huh. is right. actually what right right okay yeah and yeah, so I yeah I and, and so that's 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 weird for me because i like i know and that's the thing where even today like just to fight my urge to not say something derogatory to you know another generation about their music you know like mm -hmm. For instance, like trap is about to be old school and now drill 
is replacing that. Oh, and good Lord. <laughs> right. And so the, the temptation to not roll my eyes in the air. Right. Is is heavy. You know? Right. Right. And I don't I don't want to be the guy that's just like performatively co-signing everything just to make me look young and me look hip. Right. But, you know, it's it's weird how the timeline of music lasts, whereas something could be totally foreign to you, but seems like so innovative. It's funny because they both share a regional commonality, too, because a lot of New Yorkers, jazz musicians, because my dad is 80 something years old. And he was a jazz musician. They thought James Brown was country, just like how some New Yorkers may think about trap and, you know, other music. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, definitely that. All right. So can you tell me about your um how old were you when you felt that you really developed your drumming skills? Uh, I was probably about 15. And, and I actually like the story. I, I was in a choir class. And interestingly enough, I was the only one in the choir class that didn't have to sing, right? Uh, mm-hmm. My music teacher was incredible. His name was Terry Brown. And he was the choir teacher. And he had a class that all the talented people in school were in this class. All the singers, all the, you know, the performers, the guys that knew how to do the harmony. And I was just drawn to the class and he liked me and he let me hang out in the class, although I wasn't in the choir. And uh, I ended up like standing there for hours and hours each day. Uh, But he had a group outside of school uh, called the Mystics. And it was a three man singing group. It was Terry Brown. It was Gerald Brown, and I don't remember the third guy's name. And one day I'm walking down the hall. I'm probably I'm about 15 years old. I always carry my sticks in my pocket. I bet you could relate to that, right? Uh, I just always had kept them with me. All right. And he stopped me in the hall and he said, Hey, you have you have a set of drums? I was like, Yeah. What are you doing this weekend? He said, I want you to audition. Bring your drums to Mary Junior High School. I forgot the time and I want you to audition. So I walk in and there's three other, two other drummers. I'm sorry. There's three total. There's two other drummers. Mm-hmm. And this one guy, this guy, he has, he, he, he looked like he, he looked like he was going to kill it. He had a beautiful big Afro. He had a double bass drum and the most beautiful kit in the world. And I came in with like this little rinky dink, that's what we call it. I don't know if you guys know that word. Oh, yeah, what? Come on, I came in with I came in with the rinky dink kit, right? With like one crash symbol, one ride symbol, and some hi hats. One mm-hmm. time, like, and this dude intimidated me. But when he started playing, he wasn't good. <laughs> and I was like, oh. And we were playing. I remember the audition like it was yesterday. And we were playing the OJ's. The OJs had uh, backstabbers, 992 arguments. Same song. Uh, yeah, same song, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Right, right. That's, that's Philly music, right? And right. Uh, so when it was my turn, like I knew those songs cold. And so I, 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 I aced it and I got the gig. So that weekend, the following weekend, he took me to Chicago and we played uh, the weekend gig at a place called the Skyway. And I was 15 years old. So you were just allowed to leave the mm-hmm. crib? My mom was okay with it. Like I talked to her, she trusted my teacher. Uh, and we drove to Chicago uh, from Cincinnati, did uh, two shows and came back and had about $75. Mom was okay with that. <laughs> Oh, you got okay. real money. Yeah. Damn. Okay. Well, that, that was pretty good money. That was seriously some good money. Right? That was awesome money. Shit. And, uh, Amir, and that was the beginning. That's not what your daddy paid, Amir? He uh, what was my rate? In 1980, I made $100 a night. Um, So at the end of the week, I'd make $600. Wow. I, I was rich for like a, a an elementary school kid. That's why I bought <laughs> yeah. so many records. Um. Yeah, that's and then by good. the time I became his band leader, he, he had me somewhere in between. I think in '83 I started at 150, no, 125 bucks a show, and then by the time the very last show before I, I you know, the Roots went to 
live in London, I think. What was I making then? Maybe like 375. So, yeah, but like, you know, the four days with my dad, you know, that made me very popular. Yeah. At lunchtime. At lunchtime. <laughs> right, yeah. right, it's on a right. beer. When you yeah. want, when you want, like, you buy me a cheesesteak and beer. Like, <laughs> <so>. <laughs> Love that. Yeah. In Cincinnati, um, are there any other notable um, musicians or songwriters or, or your fellow crew that we would know that was coming up with you at the time? Yeah, yeah. Like, um, most of them you won't know, but the, the most important are the members of the group Midnight Star. And that would be Reggie Calloway and yeah. Vincent Calloway and Melvin Gentry and Bo Watson and Belinda Lipson Belinda. and yeah, and okay. they were serious. They were very serious and they were the first ones. Oh, and there's also um, my friend Tuffy who uh, played, he's a keyboard player and he played with Zap. Okay. Oh. Right. And he sung, um, he sung that song, All Right, It's Gonna Be All Right. He uh -huh. sung lead on that, right? Okay. Um, so, so there was the Midnight Star crew and Roger and the Human Body or Roger and the Vels or Zap or however you might know them. That was right. that crew. Um, and the and we always felt the we felt the energy of Parliament Funkadelic somehow, some way. Like I remember going to Club Diplomat and it was a, a bunch of musicians that looked like they might be in Parliament, right? right. <laughs> and right. they smelled like they might be in Parliament, <laughs> right? That's the important part. <laughs> <laughs> right um and, and it was broken and they had a lot of groups there was one called the over the hill gang and but they all it was a whole funk movement i just remember like it felt like they were on some tour because it was so many of these guys and they just kind of stopped at that club played that night so we were around them all but the most important and meaningful were uh midnight star and those are the guys that we actually wrote with and they produced our first album with uh, with my band and kind of taught us the art of songwriting. Walk us through the process of what it took for a band to get local gigs. Gigs. Are you localized as in Cincinnati only, or do you have it so that you can go out of state and those types of things? So, and we were Cincinnati for the for the most part, and then Indianapolis which was a hundred miles away. Okay. And, and uh, it was a kind of a strange phenomenon. Um, when, when we started, when we were ready to play in the clubs, music started to change. And this was probably like 77, something like that, 76, 77. Mm -hmm. And Cincinnati was slightly more progressive than like Indianapolis, which was, um, like I said, 100 miles away, and disco was taking over. So there were no gigs in Cincinnati. I mean, we played the clubs in Cincinnati. Like, there were like four or five clubs that we would play weekends. But somebody turned me on to a club called the Zodiac Lounge in Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. This was life-changing. Okay. So I, dr I, drive, I drive to Indianapolis with my band members, go to this club, see the club owner, and they hired us to play six nights a week. That didn't happen in Cincinnati. So now we're doing six nights a week, four shows per night, like four 45 minute sets per night, six nights a week. Per and night, night. And you're doing hundred miles each, each week. No, we, no, we, we literally end up moving there. We got an apartment there. Okay. Like we got the gig, went back, got our gear, came back, stayed in the hotel for a couple of nights. Uh, really bad, cheap hotel. Mm -hmm. Um, I forgot what it was called. Maybe it was the Rico Eight, or something like that, right? Or if it's number six. in it, you're in trouble. If it's there, yeah. there's a number in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. It was those. Uh, so we got a little apartment, and we ended up staying there for three or four, about four years, playing clubs. And it went from one club to the next, and all over the city. And that's where we really kind of learned. So, what was it about that particular environment that was a jackpot moment? As opposed to, you know, the the the, the city that Since, we would expect, right? This wide At, open door of music to come from. The, the difference was entertainment nightly, right? And and so that meant it was no longer a weekend thing. That it wasn't it wasn't which 
weekends could that could be hobby even though we were serious that could be deemed hobby whereas six nights a week that's your job okay so you're saying before 77 a monday night party somewhere wasn't a thing a no. Thursday night party wasn't a thing. Only Friday, Saturdays, and Sunday. Friday, Sat, Friday, Saturday for the most part, right? Uh, and then, and then there might be uh, an occasional wedding, fashion show, something like that. But, but for the the clubs were only weekends. Uh, and we went to Indianapolis, and it was like about it was like seven or eight clubs that had entertainment every night, and all the bands were competing. And that's when I met some. That's when I realized that there was a different caliber of musicians. Like in Cincinnati, everybody was funk. We were all funk musicians. And some people could, you know, maybe jazz influenced, maybe a little blues influenced, but we were all funk. When I went to Indianapolis, which is where Babyface is from, mm -hmm. and Reggie Griffin, you might know Reggie Griffin, and Rayford Griffin, his brother, who's like this incredible fusion drummer, right? right. And it was just a, it was an entire community of really, really gifted musicians. I realized then that I wasn't long for drumming, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, uh, they, they, they put us to shame. It was insane. Uh, but so the thing, the thing is, is I, I would think that, um, if you're there for the specific duty or task to make people dance uh intricate arrangements would that it matter i mean unless you're doing unless you're trying to do like get away by earth wind and fire or something i mean right and no. also what's the, what's the rehearsal regiment like and are you guys able to nail every song that comes down the path it's cover songs right obviously it's all cover right. songs so you know you know you learn all the rick james songs or whatever is hot you know right um and we would do that in the daytime in the basement you know or or at the club you know when we when we lived in the apartment we would do it at the club during the day eventually we got a small house and we had a basement that we could rehearse in um and try to record um but yeah it was still all you're right it was about dancing but we have four sets. So the first set, you could do whatever you wanted to do because the club wasn't crowded yet. So that's when you could do experimental stuff and try out a new song that you may have written or right. or okay. pretend to be Return to Forever. I was going to uh, say, you're going to say Return to Forever in like five seconds, I could tell. Yeah, you know it, right? <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to say Return to Forever. I just knew you know, it. Yes, we played at it, you know, we're never Wait, quite talented you enough. Something? All right, ex explain one thing though, because I think for every musician, they're either Team Weather Report or Team Return to Forever. Now, oh, that's great. In my real life, in my real life, I okay. So amongst a, a certain caliber of musician friends, I have I've I've gone on record to say that you know I feel like a bad Philadelphian because I'm not exactly. 100% on the Stanley Clark bandwagon as I should be. Right. As right. a Philadelphia. Like the song of his I love the most is so un him, which is the heaven sent joint with Howard Hewitt. Right. But what was it about Return to Forever? Because I was always team weather report, but what was it about Return to Forever that had you guys' attention? Because literally everyone your age, anyone born the latter half of the 50s, beginning of the 60s there's a love for return to forever that you know and no no, no i'm not even asking this adversarial because yes right. i love lenny white i love chicoria but i just never had someone explain to me what was it about return to forever so it was first it was chick korea it really was chick that that led that because the way he composed it felt it felt like Obviously, it was jazz fusion, but there was this classical element. Okay. And it was this classical element. And the way that they would play, the way that they would like play riffs together, you know, uh, like everybody sort of playing the same riff, you know, um, nobody else played like that. Okay. Like, uh, and they found a way to do that and be and groove and be in the groove. Uh, and 
I was, I, I like Stanley Clark, but not like Jaco Pastorius, like not even close for me personally. I know I'm going to get in trouble for this, but yeah, I'm, I'm team weather report in that conversation, like w- easily, right. exactly. easily. And, and Joe Zawano was way more soulful than like, than Chick Corea. So, mm-hmm. I mean, he did mercy, mercy, mercy for Cannonball Adderley. I mean, this boy is, that, that, this man is no joke. So right. I'm really probably a weather report guy. Uh, except that Lenny White was, the, yes. except uh, that Lenny White, you, you know, was just exactly. so bad, man. Exactly. You know, uh, okay. yeah. So, so yeah. But if I had to pick, no, I couldn't pick. No, I, I couldn't pick. <laughs> Wait I'm glad minute, I don't said, have to. You said you mentioned having a band, but what was the band's name? My band was called Essence. My band was called Pure Essence at okay. first, and and Pure Essence was. It was some kind of take on, I mean, stylistically, it was somewhere between Sly and the Family Stone, Earth, Wind, and Fire with the love of fusion music. Not the ability, but the love. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was a great way to... <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's let's okay. move forward to okay. You're you're in Indianapolis now, or you're in Indiana, right? How did you how did you meet Babyface? Uh, so he had a band. He was in a band called Manchild. Yeah, and uh, they were really good, and they were like stars, man. Everybody in the group was like looked like they were six foot and. And, and 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 weighed 150 pounds. They look like just like everybody in the band looked like Mick Jagger. I mean, it was just rock star. <laughs> look at these guys, man. Right. Um, and and Kenny was in the band. Um, he's a guitar player. I didn't meet them when we when we were in. I didn't meet him when we had the band Essence, my first band. I literally met him after we started the group, The Deal, right? Because. Uh, uh, um, a quick story was we sort of ran, my band Essence kind of ran out of gas. We got, became complacent. We didn't renew, we didn't refresh. And eventually we kind of got kicked off the circuit and this club owner, I got to tell you this, this club owner, yeah, his, tell me. Is, tell his, me. his name is Walt Manning. He owns a club called the night flight. The night flight is the hippest club in Indianapolis on one level. It's a DJ. And on the lower level, live band. And the, the deal was, if you could get people to come from the disco downstairs, that's how you make your money. Hell yeah. So they gave us a small advance, but we would get the door. And it'd be like a thousand people upstairs. And, and they, they play off the wall. They were playing Donna Summers. They were playing like disco. It was in full, full tilt. Mm-hmm. And we were downstairs and like 15 people might come down half of them would like be people that we knew. And so we had a couple of weeks off. I went to the club and asked the club owner, Walt, if I could get an advance, if I can get a hundred dollar advance for my band so I could like pay the rent and give my guys some food. And he says, there ain't going to be no advance because you're fired. And let me tell you why you're fired. You're fired because you guys suck. You're drab, <laughs> you're boring. No one comes downstairs. You need to renew. You need to rip off a sleeve or dye your hair or do something because all of this, this socially conscious thing you're doing is completely boring. You're out of step with the times. And I mean, he just read me, man. I was like, whoa. What year was this? This would have been 79, yes. 80, something like that. Oh, and I'm right like, at 80. Mm. I'm like, whoa. And y'all was still hanging on to like got to give it up, like songs from like 1976. Yeah, we still we're yeah, we're there and <laughs> and 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 early Earth Wind and Fire, like like the wrong Earth Wind and Fire songs, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, and this guy just read us, man. And then he goes into the cash register and he pulls a hundred dollar bill out and he throws it on the counter. He says, I'm gonna give you the hundred dollar bill, but I never want to see you again. And you don't owe me the hundred, but you owe it to somebody. So pay it forward and get the hell out of here. And we fired us. He was drunk and he was an alcoholic, right? Oh, I was going to say that's the best firing I ever heard. I need to use that <laughs> shit. Right. Yeah, yeah. He gave so 
I got the hundred dollars now. And I go back and I think about what the man is saying. And I immediately knew he was right. I immediately knew that we had somewhere slipped Mm -hmm. and I was like, okay, so I need to bust this thing up and start all over. And that's how we started the deal. Right. Was, um, so I, my bass player, his name is Ko. He's my best, my best friend also. Um, Uh we let everybody else go. We said, yeah, you know, Ko. Ko plays on all the records with me and face and Whitney and Bobby and all that shit. Right. He's, he's really incredible, really, really talented. Um, so he and I started the band. We first, let everybody go say guys we're going to end the band and it's just not working it's run its course so we went back to our hometown of cincinnati and he and i just sat in either his mom's house or my mom's house and we just kind of thought about like who were the most talented kids that we went to school with that also had the presence of a star like we started thinking about it differently we started thinking about it beyond like who could with beyond talent but that combination of talent and stardom, that's when that really sort of first came into my consciousness. And so we picked a couple of guys that we thought were really good. And we started the band, The Deal. We went back to Indianapolis, oh, uh-huh. where we sort of gotten kicked off the, the circuit. Mm-hmm. And I went to the club owner and I said, just give us a week. Give us one week in the club and I'll show you. Because they lost confidence in us. And that week, Oh, I left something important out. Mm -hmm. The deal was a Prince copy band. (laughs) Right. A copy band. What sort of? Not a cover, but just a copy. Stylistically. Like, we wanted to look like them. We wanted to play like them. We did some of their songs. We did some of the time, some of Prince. Right. (laughs) And we were completely like Minneapolis kids all of a sudden. All right. So can I ask, is... You know, and it's rare for me to, to ask someone who's actually of the age at the time it's happening. But when he came out, like, was it totally a this guy is just of a different ilk than everyone else? It was, was it so like obvious. It was so obvious. Like, I didn't even know whether there's records or hits or not. I didn't really look at charts and all this stuff, right? But it was so obvious that it was him. And I was, and, and also Bootsy co-signed it. I was looking at Black Beat Magazine. I don't know if you guys know that. Come on, yes, man. Dude, oh, I'm, man. I'm, I'm I don't know, man. Y'all look like really young to me. Uh, we got good but, lotion too. Yeah. <laughs> moisturized. Yes. <laughs> but uh, Bootsy right said, yeah, Bootsy I mean, said I mean, Prince is next. He said it in a magazine. And I was like, damn, I kind of thought so. But when he said it, that was like the, the validation. Right. And there was, there was no there was no turning back prince was the prince was the king i i grew up in an environment where he was taboo and you weren't not even you weren't allowed to every adult i knew hated prince right so that just made it even more like all right well let me see what they talking about but i just never been in an environment which someone who is an adult or of the age like tell the story of them seeing it and being like, yo, I like this. That's because you come from older musicians, too, because my, my mother loved fucking Prince as soon as he popped out. It, oh, my mom told me yeah. don't play that in her house. Oh, yeah. well, yeah, your mom mother was, like, was a little everyone right. thought Prince was the devil. A little yo. older. Yeah, she was like, don't older. play that because he had a song called Incest is Everything is Said to Be. And she's like, you will not play that in my house. Oh, so no. wait, time out. You. All right. So when Dirty Mind comes out now, here's the weird thing. I mean, when For You came out, you know, he was in Ride On Magazine and all that stuff. And I, I have a sister who's slightly older than me. So her and her high school girlfriends were bored. And then, you know, when the second album came out with I Want to Be a Lover and all that stuff, they were bored. Now, the thing is, when Dirty Mind came out, especially in Philadelphia, I I can, I, I, I swear to you, maybe I heard Uptown once on the radio right and besides right on magazine i would have never known what dirty mind was so it's almost as if dirty mind never came out and we went right to the time and controversy and i didn't oh wow i didn't catch up on dirty mind until after purple rain when then it was like all right you got to be completist and get everything 
But right. Philly, Philly radio was not playing anything off a of dirty mind. And I think by then, like my sister's love of that type, you know, it just sort of waned a little bit. Right. So as far as I knew, he just disappeared all of 1980. Wow. So you're saying that when Dirty Mind came out in real time. Oh, my God. It was you guys a, got it and totally understood and got it. Everything about it, the way they, they wow. dressed, everything they talked about, party up and head and all these songs that like we were deep, deep, deep into Prince, like deep into it. And just thought he was the mind, greatest he thing flopped. ever. Like in my mind, it was a flop and nobody was with it. And right. He quickly. Oh, that's like, crazy. Recovered. Like, so. We, we didn't, you know, what's crazy is that at that time we were so into Prince that we didn't judge whether something was a success or not, because we were just so blown away by his, um, first of all, that he was playing everything and, mm. and, and doing all, all that was, that was, as far as I knew, that was unusual. Mm. Um, and he was on this sort of punk thing, right? Um, and that was, he was, he was borrowing from New Wave and and incorporating it into this sort of funk thing he was just an original it felt like an original to me um Damn. was he was, so was it done in a way because i also know that you know rick kind of had a missed with a miss with the garden love record which i mean i don't know if big time really could have saved that record but he was really rick james was trying to like really make a statement like here's my my star moment and really made a pop album. Right. And what's weird right. is I can't wait to get Leroy Burgess on the show because if you listen to the intro of Big Time, you can clearly hear that edit. Like I know the Leroy Burgess part of Big Time versus Rick's portion, which is basically, I see Leroy Burgess adding that. It's like an eight bar piano intro that's clearly not Rick James. Right. And then they slice, splice uh, the rest of the song to it. But I don't know. For me, I, it, it's I, was was Rick not like in your mind? What was Rick James? Because he too was trying to establish punk, yes. punk and all that stuff. Yeah, Rick was um, Rick was a hit maker, right? Okay. Rick had the hits, you know. Mary Jane and you and I, and uh, he had the hits, but he didn't have to start them to us, right? Um, he, he was actually a hit maker before Prince was. Yeah. Right? Um, and, but we didn't focus on him. I don't know why. In Cincinnati, Indianapolis, um, the local bands all played Rick James songs, everybody. Some people played them better than others, but that was in every local band um, in their set. But you didn't it was look at music. it as innovative. It, as I think back on it, it was. But right. at that moment, I didn't think so. I thought it was just another guy making hits. I just didn't, I ne I've never focused on it. It was years later that I looked back on it and said, wait a minute, this guy's insane. <laughs> like, right. You know, this guy wrote Square Biz. Like, you know, Tina Turner. This guy's like insanely talented. Didn't really know it at the time. Just right. didn't didn't quite catch it um, because there was something about Prince that just appealed to us more. Uh, and, and you know what I think it was like in Cincinnati. I, I think we we didn't we heard black music, but we also listened to rock. Right, we listen to a lot of rock music on the radio, like, um, and so I think that that presence of of punk rock and that presence of rock and the presence of funk, that blend, Prince Prince kind of did all of that as one artist. Right. Uh, so something about that that really appealed to us. Your audiences were they receptive to it as well? Because this is also Middle America; it's not exactly yeah. New York. How are they right. adapting to? Cause y'all had the eyeliner too, right? I thought Baby Queen said y'all committed. Like y'all. Oh no, we eyeliner. went all the way. No, I'm yeah, telling you, we yeah. went all the way. What we was did, his word? Glam, not glam. Uh, breed, 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 yes! Yes. breed. Yes. Yeah, we were breed. <laughs> we were breed, which meant the new, the new breed. New breed, right, the right, new right. breed, right? We okay. were, we were our generation's version of whatever hip hop might have represented. Like we were, hmm. but except 
you had to be really bold and daring and audacious and brave to pull it off because you know you're going to be criticized by everybody on a musician level on a human level right people are going to question your sexuality yeah. and everything right yeah. you're putting a lot at risk here uh to be a part of the movement yeah. um so we went all the way eyeliner the jerry curl everything you know the makeup we would we went crazy with it uh <laughs> but but you know what's crazy is we didn't we didn't even audition for our record label we never met our record label we literally sent a photograph and a demo of two songs body talk three songs body talk a song called just my luck that face wrote and a song called i surrender we literally sent three songs and a photograph and we got signed to dick griffey to dick griffey and never this was met the man. your idea that was your idea no whose just, idea was it to do that we gave it to our man we had a manager we shared okay. a manager with midnight star his name was pablo davis okay oh okay yeah and he went to turn in he went to solar to turn in no parking on the dance floor which was midnight star's big okay. album uh -huh. right and and so we caught it. We caught a tailwind because in that meeting he said, "Okay, I also have this yeah. new band out of Cincinnati called The Deal." And he shows them the photo, plays them the demo, and we got a record deal. You remember what was on the demo? Mm -hmm. Body talk, just my luck. Oh, body body just, talk, okay, just yeah. my luck, and I surrender. Ah, okay. So the body talk that is the demo is that the version we know, or yes. did you guys? It, wow. the, dem, it, the the recorded version is a little bit better. It's okay. a little bit better. Like, uh, yeah, because you'd appreciate this. The demo was all uh, the Oberheim drum machine, right? And oh, the 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 the, the, L, the Lynn drum. Not that one. No, the first. There was one called the DX, the DMX, DMX. DMX yes. Right. Okay. okay. And it had, like it was like looked like an Oberheim keyboard. We got one. And, Right. And uh, so that the, the the demo version was purely that the the recording had like real hi hats and real crash cymbals. That's the only difference. But it made it sound it, it sounded better. Damn, I I would like to hear that one day. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, how the, the DMS was the real hot was like it's a whole different sound right and right and 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 it moved differently you okay know? yeah so so, so you kind of skipped a part okay uh how did, did that version of the deal wind up being that right. version of the deal with all the members that we know yeah because baby so, said it was some so yeah i was trying to get back to how i met face so yeah, yes. so that band is playing the clubs and you know unlike my first band pure essence uh the deal is packing them in. People are coming. Like this whole, this this edge that we had and this androgyny that we seem to have and this music was, uh, it was a sensation a little bit, a local sensation. Mm -hmm. and, and we went from having 15 people in the room to like 100 people and 110, 115, 120. Like, and we started having lines around. It was incredible. Like we had, we were a local success. If that had been the internet, we would have been trending. Like, you know, uh, we, we had a little buzz. So one night I've met Face Kenny at the time and he came to watch our band and his manager introduced me to him. And all, all I remember is us looking at each other and saying hi. And then fast forward a few months later, um, a keyboard player friend of mine called and said, hey man, Kenny Edmonds wants to um, join your band. And I said, nah, he's not breed enough. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I was like, nah, he don't have, he ain't got the thing, you know, he's like regular, he's normal, <laughs> you know, you know, no, he didn't have, no, and so I literally passed on it and then Midnight Star, I hired their keyboard player, Bo Watson. I didn't hire, I asked him to come in and play a session for us because somebody paid for a session for the deal to record and I needed a keyboard player. So I called Bo Watson, who I'd known from the Indianapolis music circuit. And Bo came over 
and he listened and he played on the record with us. And he went back and told everybody in his band, like, these guys are on to something. So the next day, the manager comes, Reggie Calloway, everybody comes and hears us. And they say, well, we love what you guys are doing. We want to sign you. We want to sign you to our company called MidStar Productions. And I was like, okay, this sounds good. This, seems, this is a little bit better than playing at the club. I'm sorry, I'm liking this. So I go to the studio one night to visit them. They were recording. And there's this guy, it's dark. He's in the booth. And I can't see the guy, but he's singing this song called Play Another Slow Jam. This time, make it sweet. And he's singing it. I'm like, who is this boy with this voice? This like this tender voice, like sounded so good. He comes out of the booth as Kenny Edmonds, except he has got on a trench coat. He's got the Jerry curl. My <laughs> man is breathed. He's completely breathed. And I'm like, yo, this is the dude I just said he couldn't join the band. And I mean, he now he is he's suited up. <laughs> and I'm like, and and the most gifted of anybody I've ever met. I had never met anybody that gifted, right? That could really like write a song and make a demo and do all the parts and sing the background and and the lyrics were like like really poetry i never wow. met anybody like him never. all it took was a raincoat and some underwear and a jerry yeah. no, and some, wait. oh 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 and <laughs> yes oh, and had the glasses you know <laughs> and that was it man and uh, that's how we um that's how that version of the band so i asked him to join the band and uh, he said, what will I do? I said, well, I'd like you to be the guitar player, keyboard player, and, and be a writer and like co-produce. Damn. But you can't sing because oh. we already have two lead singers. Right. And he was like, okay. So we went, we went, made all our demos, got a recording contract with Solar Records, and uh, he didn't sing on the first album. Wow. That changed. Yeah, that was a so, flex. Was that a, you think that when he said, okay, you know, in the back of his mind, was he like, <laughs> you'll be back? Uh, he, no, he was already set on doing a solo album, honestly. Okay. Even though he was in our band, he was already in his mind, I'm going to be a solo artist. Okay. okay. All right. So look, I mean, we've had everyone on the show, including non solar signees. One of y'all <laughs> are going to tell me a real <laughs> damn story Griffey. about Jeff Griffey. <laughs> Come on, come on, LA. Yeah. All right. Look. I love that, man. Ah, no. <laughs> but no, but, but but I got you. Ask the question. Come on, talk to me. Talk to me. Yeah, okay. Well, what what was was he like? Like? I'm out here now. Yeah. I'm outside. Let's go. We all right, first of all, you're you're you were in Indiana. You eventually going to have to go to Los Angeles. Talk about right. the move to that. But it's just the thing is, I keep hearing, like these near Suge Knight stories of don't mess with Dick Griffey. Mm -hmm. What was Dick Griffey like? So the first time I met him, uh, my first phone call was after we put our record out, put out Body Talk and it's starting to climb the charts and he calls our house. I never met the man, right? Um, and he said, he, whoever answers, he says, let me speak to Antonio. That's how he <laughs> talked, by the way. I can imitate him really good. Mm -hmm. So I pick up the phone. Antonio, it's Dick Griffey. <laughs> that record, that body talk, that record's a smash. Right? And uh, I just wanted to welcome you to the label. Da -da -da -da. Everything was like kind of, mm, mm, right? Right. Um, so I went, so after that, fast forward a little, I go to LA and I meet him and I go into his office with Reggie Calloway um, because we just mixed our album went to turn it in and I meet him and him, and, but I was a side, I was just like the kid in the band. It was Reggie Calloway and Dick Griffey's meeting. And Dick said he wanted certain things to happen on the record. And Reggie was like, no, we're not doing that. So I immediately saw, can you give me an idea of what his idea of what? <laughs> what did he want? I don't even remember what he wanted. Like, I don't remember, but. Uh, he was giving creative advice? Yeah, creative advice. Okay. okay. He was really creative. Very. Like, he, <laughs> he, 
Yes. yes okay. He was. But more he than was. in that CEO way of that's a hit. That's not a hit. What do Correct. you say? Like the vocals are too loud, or I don't like those drums, or uh, more like this is a hit versus okay. that. Mm-hmm. Or you should try this producer, or you should oh. try this songwriter, or you know, you know, putting Leon Silvers with. Shalimar, you know, oh, or yeah. like that kind of stuff. Um, okay, I got you. Yeah, he was good. He was really good. So, so my first real encounter, my first real encounter was first album comes out, second album, it's time to make the second album. And um, we make it, we make the album in Cincinnati, in Columbus, Ohio, at a studio. Mm-hmm. And we sent demos in to Dick Griffey and he liked some stuff, some stuff he questioned. He had a particular fondness for Kenny um, he, cause Kenny would sing on demos and he was like, he thought he was really incredible. So the first, my first encounter was this song called um, Sweet November yes. that Babyface did for the deal, right? And- I always thought Troop did that first. I forgot that y'all did they that. They covered it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. And so it's on the demo and Dick Griffey hears it. And he says, who is that singing Sweet November? I said, like, that's Kenny. I want that on the album. I said, well, we had a problem. I said, what's the problem? But the problem is that we made a deal when we started the group that our two lead singers, Carlos and D, would do all the vocals on the album. That's Kenny singing. And he was like, well, that's a stupid deal. And either you put that song on the record or ain't gonna be no record. (laughs) Oh. Got it. Kenny, your song's on the album. (laughs) Guess what? Sweet November made the album, right? So that was my first sort of encounter. How are you taking the unofficial, I guess you're now the the, the figurehead, the father of the group? Yeah, I kind of always was. I don't know. I, it was my idea to go rent, get everybody. I put it all on my shoulders and said, I, you know, if you guys yeah. rock with me, I'll do my best to take care of you. You know, yeah, it so, seems like you from as you when you are hearing this about you now, it makes sense that you were the one that kind of could yeah. bridge the gap between the business and the creative. Like you knew how to talk to both sides. That's- I tried to. Yeah, I, I, I yeah, because I had to negotiate with the club owners. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Uh, uh, you know, for for pay and when they wanted to deduct expenses and you know, so yeah, I had to, I had to do the tough guy work. Um, uh, okay. But and they trusted me. You know, all of us went to high school together, by the way, except for Babyface, who was in Indianapolis. But the rest of the band, we all went to high school together. We were all in that choir class with Mr. Brown. And, you know, so we we were all really like good friends and grew up together um, in the same neighborhood. So um, there was a trust factor there. Since you're talking about uh, the um, uh, the material things album. Yeah. OK. I, you know that album, dude. I have everything. I'm, spring, I'm so impressed, but Chris, yeah, I'm so impressed with you, man. I just got to tell you, man. I never met anybody with your That's level of, of musicology. That's why they can't have a versus. <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't know. But my 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 question about material things is, and I always I don't know why it is, um, but the the Tom Tom programming. I never heard a song in which the kick drum and the tom toms have to compete with each other. <laughs> Next, why? So I always wanted to know all that stuff, right? Who gets the final word on a final mix? Because okay, when I was younger, material things irked me because I was like, "Yo, those tom toms are way too loud for this song." They were, but as I got used to hearing it. In my older age, I was like, "All right, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I can see." No, you were right. Being innovative, but like, who, who back for those records? Was it the Callaway Brothers that were leaning on the production? Was it were you guys allowed a word in Edgewise? Like, just okay, so structuring the the albums. Full disclosure: the first album called Street Beat was completely produced by Reggie Callaway. And the songs were co-written by 
the members of our band and members of Midnight Star. Mm -hmm. Okay. When it was time to make the second album, Material Things, uh, we had fallen out. You and the Callaway, the Callaway. Us and the Cal us and the, and Midnight Star, we had kind of fallen out. And Reggie didn't want to produce the second album, so Dick Griffey said, "You produce it." So it was on me. I'm like, "It's on me." Reggie didn't want to produce it, or you guys didn't want Reggie to produce it. We we wanted Reggie, but Reggie didn't want to do it, and I don't why know why. That? that was I didn't know why. I thought there was some. It probably has something to do with money. Some, some. He never said to me like, "I don't want to produce your record," but it felt businessy. Did he have that option again? Y'all still tell me nice guy stories about Dick Griffey, but does Reggie Calloway have an option to mess up the money by saying, "You know what? I'm not going to produce the second album." Yeah, because he and Dick Griffey visited my apartment in Cincinnati, and we played them demos that we worked on. And they collectively decided which songs we should record. So oh, he okay. Dick gave him a pass. Yeah, he let him he he, he let him sit it out. So uh, so Kenny and I like co-produced together. So all those decisions, loud ass Tom songs too fast, or that's uh, or that's all me and Kenny producing for the very first time in our lives, and and having. Following a hit record that Reggie produced, now it's on us, and it was it was a complete stiff. Wow! It was really? a complete stiff. That's a good lesson for for class, though. That's that's amazing. weird. Yeah, that's it's weird for me. Yeah. All right, so here, this is what I'm just learning, and you know, uh, I, I mean, I guess I alluded to the stuff I'm working on, um, past summer soul. But um, mm -hmm. I'm currently I haven't made an official announcement because, you know, I will say that there was a popular dance show of mm -hmm. the 70s. Mm -hmm. Right. And maybe uh, other decades um, of which I'm learning that <clears throat> I'm learning that uh, the 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 host of said uh, Dan show mm -hmm. has relationships with different uh, CEOs and 100%. no, no matter what the state of the record is on the outside world. Cause there's songs that was played on this show so many times that I would instantly thought, Oh, that's a hit. One of them, which being material things like all of 1984's season, like, if you get four spots on the most important dance portion of that show, mm -hmm. then to me, that was like, oh, you have a bona fide hit. And it was only right. later that I figured out that material things didn't get the the same push that body talk and I surrender. I, I mean, you know, it's right. just, exactly. It simply wasn't good. It wasn't so, good. Were you guys scared? And were you afraid of getting dropped? No, I didn't even think about it. I, I, you know, by the way, I've been dropped and fired a lot of times. I never think about it. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> so this wasn't the first time. So. Bars. No, I just got fired. From, I just got fired from the night flight. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm immune to it. You know, I love it. You uh, ain't nobody till you get fired from somewhere. That's what you used to say. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but no, no, we didn't think about getting dropped. All I thought about was, damn, those, this record, just, I couldn't get it right, man. I couldn't get it right. I just couldn't get it right. I tried so many times, you know, because the studio, I mean, studio wasn't cheap, but we had it on lock. So we could go in and mix it, press it, acetate, go to the club, play it at the club. It didn't sound right. We'd go back and try it again a couple of days. And we tried everything. And then when we thought we had it right, and we turned it in. The label apparently agreed because they made it the single, uh, and it just didn't work. And it was just embarrassing more than anything. But it also put a fire in all of us, and I would say particularly myself and Kenny. It really put a fire into us that, and we're competitive people, so we were like, we can't let Midnight Star be responsible for our success. 
And then when we get the shot, we blow it. Right. Let's get okay. to work. Okay. So I'm glad you said that because this is a question that I tried asking Jimmy Jam, and I still wasn't satisfied with the answer. Now, I owned Eyes of a Stranger. I mean, I've owned all your records. But when Eyes of a Stranger came out, and I always have this question, I will ask you, I will ask the SOS band, I will ask Boys to Men. How bold do you have to be in order to start with a your first three songs on the album with ballads? Yeah. Especially in this mind state where you're like, wow. we got to grab them by the collar. Right. In your mind, you were like, two occasions is so damn Teflon. We better open with this joint. Like, are you guys Wait not thinking? In my I gotta mind, look at the, I got to look at the track list and to see if you're and right. And it's the first record. No, it's the first record on the track list. It, so, it yeah. opens it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Let me see some eyes. Like, put, with my eye, like, what, literally, yeah. in my and mind. And they back to back. That's interesting, Amir. Wow. Yeah, they and the thing is, the way the way that I see wow. records and building records and like the drama and the the yeah. like the up and like two occasions to me was always either the fourth song on side A, wow, or the, sec or the second song on side two. Y'all, oh, it, to me, it's almost like opening Thriller with Human Nature. <laughs> I can't believe I just this doesn't make sense to me. Which what? what? Because I, I think in terms of albums. What do you mean? And this is also that explains why you have way more hits than I do. <laughs> hey, <yeah>. No. <laughs> I love no, it. I think I think that's a resequence, man. Okay. No. You, you have you have the actual vinyl or cassette or something because. Not there. I don't expect you to have it there, but I'm saying it's the 1987. I can't, I can't believe that. I thought "Can You Dance" was the first song on the album. Hang on a second. Uh, I'm now checking all the streaming services. Discogs. Yeah. No, well, on Apple Music, it is. Yeah, y'all are right. It's one and two, and Hold "Can on. You Dance" is five. Yeah, yeah that, that's you not sounding right. Opens okay, the record and this. Uh, well, I mean, obviously, it worked because I think when anyone thinks of the deal it's two occasions and at that it's yeah it's right a rush all right all right so this is but weird. that wasn't even our first single hold up what was the on. what was the first two occasions was the... well damn sure it wasn't shoot him up no no hold on i'm gonna tell you okay where's that album where's that album eyes of well, stranger okay Boom, while he's looking is. for it this reminds oh me shit that. man you're right again <laughs> hold up <laughs> No, I'm, I'm only sorry. Just looking at it, it's straight up. Yeah, this is cable, right? I can curse. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm not slipping. Is. I'm sorry. Well, this is, don't be no, sorry. No, but listen, and it, this really brings it back full circle because when I don't know if you remember this conversation, like you, um, the day that things fall apart came out, mm -hmm. February twenty third, nineteen ninety nine. The next day, I spoke to you. Cause you were telling me about like, you know, you, you were on the radio and all that stuff. Mm. And you gave me a message from your mom and your mom said, why would they bury the Erica Badu song at the end of side two? Yeah. Wow. Why yes. <laughs> why do we have to sit through that entire yeah. album to get to it? <laughs> Which was kind of like my plan. It was like, okay. okay. Cause that's some the thing. Y'all heard that already. Y'all heard right. that. Here's some making them listen to it. Okay. Y'all would have never gotten through the rest of the record to see who we were before we got you. But you the did the end. opposite of what LA did. Wow. I know, but that's to that's me. That's why he's LA. <laughs> <laughs> no, stop. No. Now maybe, I'm, maybe I'm we trying to open with you got me. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I tell you, I, I, I swear I don't remember. I really don't remember. But the only logic that I can come up with is it's what up I front. put, put the, hits the hits up front. Up front. Put That's the only thing I can think right. of is put the hits mm -hmm. up front, right? Um, but we put out, yeah, we put out Can You Dance and we thought we kind of gotten it right. Okay, we got it right now. Okay. Now we got it. This is better than, this is better than material things. Sonically, it's better. Got a right engineer. Tom's not overshadowing everything, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And it didn't work at all. We got nowhere. And then Dick Griffey came. And this is what Dick stepped in. Right. He said, he says, comes to the studio. Play me all the records. 
It's play me he's sitting there. And he's mean about it too. Like that's like that. Like, play me all the records. Like I'm sick of you. You know, because because by the way, I forgot to tell you, I, I picked another stiff. I I not a stiff, but Babyface's first solo album was called Lovers. Lovers and um I love you, babe. And I no, I picked you make me feel brand new to cover as the single. Oh yeah. And wait, yeah. that came out before I love you, babe. Yeah, yeah. And I don't that even was, remember that. And it was cute, but that was me thinking that the, I didn't know. And Dick Griffey was like, <laughs> you just Dick was like, you just think you know everything, don't you? I mean, that's how he talked to me. Like, let me, let me tell you something. This is my record company, and this is my studio, and we're doing that no more. So he picked the hits. Yeah, I picked the all the wrong songs. I like I picked <laughs> I picked you made me feel brand new for Babyface, and I picked Can We Talk for the Deal. Both wrong. Yeah. Dick comes back and picks um um two occasions. What's it called? Two or shoot. November. He picks two occasions and shoot him my movies. Shoot him my movies. Yeah. He gave me that song. Wow. Which, he gave me the song. It's another guy. It's the only time my band ever did a song that we didn't write or co-write. He gave me that song and said, this might be good for you. So Kenny and I went and we produced it. But um, did, did you like it? Song. I did like it. I liked it, liked it. But my band hated it. Wait, which one are we they talking were. about? Movies? Did y'all like the cover? Shoot them up movies. Oh, OK. Wait, who did the cover? Who Wait, did the cover? Who did the cover? Who did the cover? <laughs> Uh, Bobby Dick from uh, on No Limit Records. He, he covered uh, shoot 'em up movies and like. You kidding? Uh, <laughs> just when yeah, we're done <laughs> listen to Moby Dick's cover I'm of shoot 'em up movies. Like, I just want to be clear. I'd, By the way, we only did, we did it because Dick wouldn't make he wouldn't let us have music videos. He said we weren't pretty enough, so we couldn't uh -huh. do music videos. Really? So I figured if I do two occasions, I mean I'm not two occasions. I'm do, we do Moby shoot 'em up movies, which is a song he gave us. Maybe we might get a music video. Yeah. That's right. Y'all have not done music videos. We didn't have no music videos. I... Oh. Yeah. But everybody else on the label, Shalomar had the music videos and oh. and oh, every... the weirdest music videos of all time. Right. But we oh, didn't get any. So were so but... their videos were so off kilter, man. But y'all right. were so pretty. That's so, so wait, odd. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you. <gasps> all right. So here's the deal. I'm gonna ask you a question as a CEO. Okay. about your artist self and hopefully because i think you're one of the first major ceos we had on the show and i need it explained to me like i'm a 12 year old okay now uh, uh, an out of the box hit like two occasions now as a person who has not had a lifespan and i'm talking about myself Mm -hmm. As a singles artist, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I've had many top 10 albums, you know, whatever. I make my living on the road. But as a singles artist, I'm not. I'm led to believe that hits are manufactured. Not in that sort of organic way that we're led to believe it is where it's like you're just suddenly singing. And every time I close my eyes, you know what? I, I like that two occasion song by the deal. And then you call the radio station and you request it, and then it becomes a hit. I'm led to believe, especially now, that deals are already made. And I'm not asking about the process of how deals get made. Mm -hmm. But is two occasions a hit because it just organically spread that way? Or mm -hmm was the solar muscle again i'm not going to give up until i get a dick griffey story <laughs> behind it to make it a hit okay so what i think or is it a meet you halfway thing give us a song we could work with and then we'll ram it no i i i am shamelessly commercial let me just put that out there, right? I'm you and I are opposites in that regard. Like I am, I am like so singles oriented. Like like especially like the first two songs I picked were stiffs. So I became like I'm gonna get this singles thing down, right? So I I Wait, before let me interrupt yeah. you real quick, I, and I want to use this opportunity to actually dispel a myth. Okay, I am not anti singles. Oh, I actually no. No, I don't think I, you're anti singles. I'm not anti singles, I and I <laughs> will admit, good. I will, I will 
freely admit, I mean, this might be Captain Obvious to, you know, Fonte, whatever, is I think for half the people that just pose like, ah, oh, man, I ain't with that bubblegum pop shit. It's I believe that pop songs are the hardest things to execute. Right. 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 That's right. You give me a free jazz song. I'll knock that shit. I, it'll be on the right. next Robert Glasper record, you know, right. instantly. But I don't know. You know, and I think since I've put in 20,000 hours of DJing, hard DJing between the last Roots album. Yes. And now there's like nine years of that. I'm I'm hyper aware of what songs work and don't work that I didn't have in my first. Now, I guess my job is to mm-hmm. not make it so, you know, now that I know the, 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 the secrets of the codes or whatever, to figure out how to nuance my knowledge and not just make it like, OK, now that I know we need hit singles, like I know what our fan base expects of us. However, I'm, I, I just want to say that. I'm not anti-pop because I, get I, th- I think it's, you know, kid music. I just never knew how to do it. Right, right. I completely get that. Listen, I, I have, this may be a fair or unfair comparison, but first version of Cool in the Gang and then the pop version of Cool in the Gang. Right. right. They right. made they made Too Hot and all those songs that were great, but I hated that band. Like, I loved the original Cool in the Uh-oh. Gang when they play. Like, but how do you okay. feel now about looking back on that? As an but look, looking back on it, but that was me. That was me before record companies, before anything. It was just a preference. I'm like, y'all soft. That's soft. Like, that's like, what is, come on, where's Hollywood swinging and those crazy intros and the horns and like, those are just songs. I didn't like it at all, right? Um, now I understand the difference. I still prefer the first version of Cool in the Gang. So what I'm saying is you and your band can't really afford to do it, man. If y'all really, if y'all really did it, like what happens is that you disappoint a, a, a lifetime of fans. Yeah. And no matter how you feel about it, at that point, maybe for the first time, you're gonna be really criticized for trying to get a hit. So it's that it's it's won't be the first time. Because <laughs> But you're you're so successful at what you do that that would be a mistake. My opinion is that that would be a mistake, right? Unless it were completely organic, completely like nothing changes except this song just happened to catch, right? But yeah, because if, if you I'm did not, anything hmm. to 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 um, if, if you look of, like you're trying, yeah, if you look like yeah. you can't do that. Now I would say now like, you you're you're a that. savior. You could you I'm, can't do that. I'm not doing that. However, I am so aware that wow we never we've had grooves but we never had a melody line there's never a part of the song that you can whistle and it sticks with you but that's not right. true and also isn't there a gray in there isn't there the fact then that maybe y'all were just missing an la ear when it comes to singles because for me as the radio girl listening to all these records that y'all put out at times i just felt like y'all didn't hear the single y'all well, put out the wrong song like right, what about so, the gray in there so, so as of the speaking Flexity. As, as as of this conversation, two days ago, um, I'm 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 talking right now from New Orleans. Uh, we okay. just did the Essence Festival, and for the first time, we've played uh, with Little Kim, mm. and of course, the subject of Lighters Up comes up. Now, for uh, those that don't know, um, mm, mm, Little mm. Kim's Lighters Up song was a root song. Oh, uh, that yes. I don't Watch. know. <laughs> <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. One what day happened? on Quest Love Supreme, he'll answer uh, the question. Scott. <laughs> all right. All, all, <laughs> all I can say was uh, when Tariq and I went to Florida, we made lighters up. We took a three hour dinner break. By the way, having dinner with OJ Simpson and Buster Rhymes. Long story. Yeah. Whoa. And, and, <laughs> long story. Come back to the studio, finish the music of, of what you know is Lighters Up came back, you know, pretty confident, like, hey, we're going to have a good first single for our Tipping Point record. And next thing I know, like a month later, I hear that song with Little Kim on it. And I was just like, what the fuck? Oh, wow. But good choice, Scott. Well, I mean, I mean Scott. no, Scott yeah. obviously gave it to Kim. Yeah. But. 
Oh, Scott Storch. Oh, yeah, oh, Scott yeah. Storch oh. was you know Scott, original Roots member. Scott was that's a member right. of the Roots. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So even then, my whole point was that, and you know, we joked about it, like you know, this is our song first or whatever. Did she but know? Even, but uh, she was surprised. She's like, I, yeah. she like, I I heard you play drums on it, but no, mm-hmm. I I if you remember and do the right thing when Samuel mm-hmm. Jackson does the senior love daddy. Uh-huh. The roll roll call, call thing. Yes. If you listen to that music in the background, I was do the right thing was on in the break room. And I remember that I was like, hey, let me see if I can make a song without a snare and just with hi hats and cymbals. That's what I was. Wow. That's what I was making. Then Scott put piano on top of it. And it was like, all right, this this could work. But my whole point is that even if we kept that song, I'm not even certain. It would have really huh. went off like that. He would have done to that song what she did to it. Right. So it's right. almost like, yes, right. it, it went with this rightful owner. Again, we don't have a filter in us that knows right. how to not flex our intellect. Like, Tariq has to be the smartest guy in the room right? instead right. of the most relatable guy in the room. And did, Rich, and did Rich ever let anybody else help pick a single? Uh, Rich was brilliant, too. Oh, he is? Uh, but, yeah, definitely. But, 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 well, but I mean, me... Scott made it up to us by doing Don't Say Nothing, but then that's when our fan base sort of clapped back like, yeah. but, but I I thought Don't Say Nothing was clever because I like the fact that Tariq was saying something nonsensical. No, the right. PD record, the PD record on that album, but that's just, okay. But that's here's the thing. Here, here, here's, here's how, here's my take on it. There's two kinds of stars. There's the artist and there's the song, right? Songs can be stars, right? And artists can be stars. And when the two collide, you get Whitney Houston, I don't know, right? You get, you know, the the big, whoever you might like, Michael Jackson, you know, but sometimes the artist is the star, but not necessarily the song. And sometimes the song is a star, but not necessarily the artist. Big facts. Right? Yeah. And that's oh, how I wow. look at it. So I separate those two, right? Return wow. of the Mac. Great example. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> exactly. Aww. That song is a star, right? Yeah, that song is a jam. Right. And there's a that's lot, true. and there's there's many of those. But that's then there's the root, also right. there's the also a very, very talented artist, Tori Amos. She, I don't know if you listen yeah. to her, but Come, she's yeah. not a hit maker, but she's incredible. Yeah. Right. And, and you know, and there and there are others, you know. Um but so I separate the two. That's how so I that's think, how I look at it. So wait a minute, my question wait for that. Minute. Hold on, hold on. My question for that. Uh so do you think that the industry as it is now makes space for those kinds of artists? Do you think there's a space for those artists to exist like on major labels where it's like, okay, you may not have the hit record or the TikTok song that's going off, but you mm. just are an amazing artist. And I think there's an audience for that. All right, you're not gonna like my answer. Nah, and, and it's gonna get me in trouble. Nah. And I got a, I got a tag on top of Fonte's question. Okay, go ahead. My answer to that is not if you're black. No, you better tell oh. your truth. Oh. Listen, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> if you're black, you better have a hit. Listen, oh, that's that's you, that's that's true. If you if you if you got a hot garage band that don't make hits, don't no problem. We just put you on the road. Just stay on the road till you get a hit. <laughs> or, yeah, or you better be the band that's on a label that believes in that. Which yeah, is that's what, right. And Yo, that's so literally, I don't yeah. even know if I told people yeah. this. The only reason why the Roots lasted that long is because it was in our contract. If you have album number one, we have to make three albums. If you have album number four, we have to make three albums. If you have album number seven, you have to make... So we couldn't get dropped into... Like that right. was that was the only way that we never got we would have gotten dropped otherwise. Wait, I have to ask this because I heard. All right, so po- post and I'm so jumping ahead in the future, but since you brought it up, I believe the story that was told to me was uh, back when I, I think this was um, eighty, not eighty. This was either 1999 or 2000, I believe, mm-hmm. you you guys signed an artist named uh, Stephanie 
Zermanata to the oh. label. Mm-hmm. Uh oh. Okay. Who, that would have been probably a little later than that. Probably oh. Well, yeah, six thousand. Okay. All right. My whole point is that the Fiona Apple incarnation of Lady Gaga uh, was, to my knowledge, on a Def Jam artist, or she was signed to the label. And yep, I signed her. Right. Uh, what did Josh, you see in that artist that later morphed into what we know now? And we're talking about what I what I saw the the day she came in. Um. She plays rock and roll piano, first of all, and she's incredible at it. Right. Um, and she came in and she had on the white go-go boots and and she was like just seducing the piano. I mean, you know, she gets in it. She's inside the keys, right? Yeah, and she's doing Tori I, Amos. I just, thank you. Right. <laughs> I was going to say that, but I did, if right? You know, if you know Tori Amos. That's what I saw. In her prime show, yeah. That's what I saw. Right. And, and I thought, she was incredible. And I remember saying to her that, and she reminded me of this because my memory is not that good. She told me that in that room, I told her that she would likely change music. That's how passionate I was. Mm-hmm. So we signed her and then they started to bring me demos. And when I heard the demos, like I didn't hear that same thing that I saw mm-hmm. and I didn't like it. And, and I had Rihanna and Justin Bieber and, Kanye and the dream and everybody. And I was feeling myself way too damn much, right? Note to self, like, don't be feeling yourself. Um, and they were, and I was like, this is, I don't want to put this out. Like, this is not it. This is not the girl I signed. This is not, this isn't moving me. And I let her go before we ever released the record. And, and then she found Akon, Red One, and ultimately Jimmy Iovine, and she put out Just Dance, and it started blowing up in Canada. I was watching it, because I didn't want to be embarrassed. Mm. (laughs) Mm. I was like, Mm. that's just Canada. Mm. Then I started seeing it blow up in Miami. Mm. That's just Miami. Mm -hmm. That's just the clubs. Mm. Then it started blowing up in the Bay. Mm. Then it charted. Mm. And man, and then it became Gaga. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, you stupid. <laughs> you feel like, well, wait a minute. Wow. Yo, so, okay. So question. So in that situation, in your role as an executive, how much of it is putting out or uh, putting out things that you like versus a record may come to you and it's like, okay, I personally don't like this but I know that it will work with this audience. Like how much of it yeah. is like your personal? It's a little bit of like, if it's a little bit of both. First of all, I, I will stand, even in that case, I, I, I clearly blew it. But for the most part, I'll stand by other people that work at the label. If they say they're passionate about something, I'll give it a shot. It doesn't have to just be my thing, right? Gotcha. Um, but if it's something that I signed that I mm-hmm. personally endorsed, then I want to feel good about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and in those cases, I'm kind of listening to me, right? Um, uh, but th- I just blew it, man. I just completely blew it. I have to appreciate, but here's the thing I appreciate about this story. Um, we've had three artists on the show that told us the story of where it wasn't working out with their label staff. Right. And And instead of just being like, you know what? You're right. Let's 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 call it a day and let you go. I learned that the label will sometimes just freeze an artist out just to avoid the embarrassment in yes. case that happens. Yes, for sure. People hold on. Um, they don't want to be wrong or they don't want to make a decision. And um but I don't respect that. Like, I rather like, listen, I blew it. And I tell you, I blew it. And, and while it, while it, it, it pains me and, and it's embarrassing, I'd rather live in that truth than to have shelved her and just made her keep mm-hmm. going back and going back and going back when I knew I didn't like it. I didn't like it. It wasn't for me. Right. So if it's not for me, perhaps she could have a life somewhere else. And I'm actually okay with that as embarrassing as it is. How different was the music? 
that she presented to you, how well, different was it than what she presented to the world? It was very different. Because if you know her, you know she's diverse and she could do many mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. And the kind of music she made on the first album and a little bit on the second album, she's never revisited that. So she's clearly able to do a lot of different kinds of music. Um, and it wasn't that was like uh, like dance pop or I, I don't know. That's what I called it, you know. So um, it wasn't EDM yet or. No, no it, it wasn't that flavor at all. It was kind of piano based, a little bit jamming, a little okay. bit. Yeah, but it just okay. didn't, they didn't feel like hits. All right, we gotta get back in the time machine because I'm not. All right, come on, come on. We're all over the place, right? Yeah, because I'm having about a great time. Really uh, what I what I want to know, well, I want to know what touring with the deal was like across the states, as opposed to just you guys being in one environment as a club band. Like your first, uh, your first touring. Oh, oh my God! Our first, the first show we had as the deal with Body Talk as a hit. We opened for the DeBarge and Luther Vandross. Oh, that's we, right. Sounds familiar. Life changing yes. moment, right? First show was yeah. at um, uh, in Indianapolis at Market Square Arena. Mm. So now, now we have a band that's gone from playing club that could barely hold 200 people to Market Square Arena. And we hit that stage and we were the opening act. So we got a line check, but not a sound check. And I like to use that as an excuse uh, uh, why we were so bad, but we were horrible. I mean, we were so horrible. When we got off stage, like we didn't even, you know, we're supposed to be excited. That's our first show is in a big arena and a major tour. And we should have been like really happy and excited and, and slapping each other five and, and having a celebratory moment. But uh, we were really embarrassed by it. Uh, we we didn't have we were not built for that big stage. We didn't know what we were getting into, and and we overdid our um, we overdid our 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 gimmick Which too was? much makeup, Ooh. too much <laughs> too much too much everything for all and the cities or for certain cities. No, this was just this one show. The very just first one show. show. Oh, it's the first right? show. The first show. Okay. So the show is over. And I'm in the hotel room. My road manager, his name is Leon Burnett, wonderful man. He comes, says, Dick Griffey wants to talk to you. Mm -mm. I'm like, uh oh. I said, okay. And I don't remember the conversation that well, but I remember being a little bit frightened and not threatened, but warned. If we come out like that again, we're off the show. And I remember him saying, uh, something about Sylvester, okay. right? Like we don't want no more Sylvester's. We don't want no something like that. Like it was something like that. And anyway, we cleaned up our act, and the next night we were a lot better, right? But the first night, man, we blew it so badly. Um, it was just really bad. And then we got a little used to it. Luther embraced us. Elder Barge embraced us, and we all kind of became friends. And then they started. You know, this we we got treated a little bit better, and we got better, and we had some nights when we actually really caught a good rhythm. Um, but well, I've heard stories of Luther's restrictions. A friend of the show is is uh, Chef Gordon, who would yes. say how anal retentive Luther was with the lights you can use or the colors you can wear. Or yes. We never heard about colors. Definitely the lights and how many channels on the mixing console and things like that but like luther and i were buddies um you know and and kenny because like he has so much respect for kenny as a songwriter because mm -hmm. we used to give luther demos when we were on the road uh so we just kind of built a relationship and uh we never felt like there was a lot of restrictions there yeah. um as a matter of fact he wouldn't even make us leave the backstage he would let us stay you know Cause there used to be this when the superstar comes out of the dressing room. All right, everybody yeah. go in your dressing. Everybody over here. You go that's, over there. Now go over here. It was like that's still it's a mess right now. It definitely <laughs> still happens. That still happens. It's a right mess. Now. One of those and, people and going like, to jail for thirty years, but he used to do that all the time. Right. It was like yeah. insane. Um, but Luther didn't do that to us. He let us hang. Right. Um, uh, and oh, did you know Yogi Horton, the drummer? Yes. And I, I own a snare drum. You do? Yeah, I, I 
got lucky. Oh my god! So how? Happy. By the way, I'm sorry. Sidebar. How good was he? Like, I want to know what you thought. Yeah, I love your humor. Actually, one of the very first instructional, um, one of the first instructional drum things I used to my my teacher used to make me watch. Yogi did one before he wow. passed away. Wait, can I ask? Did he pass away while on tour? Um, yes, but not that tour. Uh, Were you guys on the tour, or uh, we weren't on the tour that he passed away on? It was two years later. Okay, because right. I, I always wanted to know how how did Luther recover, like finding another drummer and that sort of thing. I wasn't yeah. around, but we were on the tour when Marvin passed away. We were on tour with Luther when Marvin passed, and and uh, I remember us having a a prayer moment backstage, completely quiet, everybody on the tour holding hands, and really? Luther. Yeah, it was a really it was really moving. It was really something. Luther was really torn by it, right? All of us were, but I didn't know Marvin personally, but obviously was touched by his music. But Luther must have been very close to him because he he assembled everybody, every truck driver, everybody backstage, right? Oh, really? Yeah, it was really special. So really the special. reason the reason why I'm asking you about tour life is because I know eventually you're going to morph into just production. Which of course means that right. you're going to have to leave the band, but in your mind, is it like, okay, there has to be something else other than this? Like, what? Where, where's the point where suddenly the the wheels are turning and you're like, okay, we we have to be a team. We have to write hits. Like, how does that happen? Oh, for me, it was you know, it was for me, it was. Um... We enjoyed being on the road. I enjoyed it uh, on the very first tour that we did. And the second album, as we talked about material, things didn't work. So we didn't have as much work, um, but we still did some some gigs here and there. Uh, we worked. And then the third album took a while. So between our second album and the third album, we started to develop as songwriters and producers a little bit better. And because the second album was, wasn't a success, we had a little more time on our hands. So when we went back to do the tour with two occasions, um, I was over it. Like seriously was over it, like before the tour started. And cause I couldn't play anymore, man. I'd lost, I didn't, I don't know what happened, but I, I, maybe I started thinking about it or I don't know, but something got into me and I just couldn't play anymore. And uh, my hands were hurting. Like I felt like I had arthritis in my hands and, uh, and I, I just, I lost it. I, I mean, at 16, I thought I was really good. You know, at 21, I thought I was really good. And by my mid twenties, man, it just started to go away. Mm. And I literally, never got it back so like i i i still have this and that didn't have, upset you yes it really upset me except one thing i took that drum machine and i <laughs> mastered that thing i yes. i was right i was like i don't care who you are jimmy jam teddy riley i'm challenging anybody <laughs> i could do this better than anybody right and so i switched and what was Wait your drum machine of choice what was your drum of choice I had every drum machine they made, man. I had the lead drum, the DMX, the 808, I, everything. Gotcha. For me, I, I have to say, you do, you do have a trademark. It's, I don't know how you did it or why you did it, but I noticed it. Every fourth, maybe every eighth clap, you will put extra emphasis on the refurb. Right. <laughs> right. right. Some claps will be normal. I got that from Jimmy Jam. I, I straight stole that from Jimmy Jam because he did it on control. Control. Right. Um, and I loved it so much. Um, so it was really Jimmy's signature. I borrowed it. We're friends. But it He's wouldn't not mad be about every, it. It wouldn't be every clap. It would be, it wouldn't be every one of them, though. It was strategically placed. And right. for me, when I think of the sound of classic like when I think of Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, it's like the sound of the classic 808. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Like right. the, the sound that uh old boy uh who produced loose ends and uh, five Nick Martinelli. Yeah, but like the sound that Nick Martinelli Hooper, stole. Right? No, no, Nick Nelly Hooper was sold to so Nick Martinelli, he was loose ends. Oh, Nick Martinelli, that's right, that's right. Yeah, that's five right. star, like anything that sounds like Jam and Lewis. Doo -doo 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 -doo. 
like that's their trademark. But for you, it was always right. And to this, yeah, to this day, like no one has mastered that level of of gated reverb better. Oh man, than you did. But was that okay? You say you took it from. I mean, but still, you know, you, you we learn from each other, and then I, you know, you embellish it and do things with it. But, uh, but I would spend hours, hours and hours and hours and hours playing with those drum machines and playing with rhythms and taking Kenny's keyboards and muting them and putting them through filters and playing. I just played with the sound, you know, mm. um, a lot, and that became my new passion. So that and the, a lot of that was because, by the way, I never actually played live on uh, on a recording session. Really? Right. Okay. I did when I was young. Like when I was young, I did some records. But like after we had the deal, and when we became uh, and started making records, like I never actually played a live kit on a drum on a, on a record. Like never, never on a hit record. Right. Uh, okay. You know what it's called for. Right. I was. I just and then I heard you, and then I was like, Oh, right, get out of here, man. <laughs> I remember that Eric about do record. I was like, yo, who right. my son turned me on. He's like, I was like, who is that? Mm, mm, and then mm. I read about you in Rolling Stone magazine and, and with your dad and all. Thanks, yeah, I'm man. done drumming. Uh, anyway. All right. So can you talk to us about the, the conversation that leads to you and Kenny? Like really making this official. Who was the first outside non-deal artist that the L.A. and Babyface that we know of? Uh, let's see. The very first one was when we officially did it together. That would have been the Whispers. Rocksteady. Mm. Yeah, Rocksteady. That's when we did it together. Uh, and they hired Kenny. They called Kenny. They didn't call both of us. And Kenny uh, said, um, I have to have L.A. with me. So he pulled me along. OK. Right. Uh, um, and and it was really special. It was really good looking out. And and we had a comfort level working. Uh, but Kenny was obviously really famous in at Solar as a songwriter. Mm. And more so than like the two of us, you know. And because of, um, yeah, that's kind of what happened. And we went in, we made Rocksteady, and then it became official, you know. Did and you know that was a pop hit or immediately did it become wow. a pop it no i knew it immediately i swear to you i did like when what I, when we were writing it i knew um when we were, we were in an apartment on on um we lived on highland avenue in hollywood and when we were writing it i had a really good feeling about it but then when we got in the studio and we laid it down and we put the whispers on the background vocal before they sang lead I remember, I'll never, ever forget that moment. I was like, oh, my God, this is a smash. Mm -hmm. I knew it. Mm -hmm. And people in the studio knew it. Like in other rooms, people would come around while we were working on it and hang out in the doorway and watch. It was just something special going on in that room. And we knew it. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, when, you know, Scotty and Walter from the Whispers put their vocal on it, they just that was icing on the cake. But I swear to you, I already felt it was a hit. And that goes back to your other question. Like, are, are hits manufactured or manufactured? They, is it organic? I think that it's a little bit of both. The thing is, is that rocks. I mean, you know, the, the whispers are no stranger to the top 10. Hence, right. and the beat goes on. But like, it was surprising for me in 1987 that pop radio Me too. was playing this song. Yeah. Right. And as if they were a new group or whatever, like anytime I see the whispers sing, both Scotty twins sing in t tandem. Right. Who's doing the singing? It's Scotty. I'm sorry. I said it wrong. It's Scotty. Scotty's the one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Walter, Walter is a lighter version. Same, same, a very similar tone, very similar, but but uh, Scotty has more power. Oh, that's your answer. Right. So when is it when it's gua 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 gui gua 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 gui time? That's that's Scotty that we know. That's Scotty. Like, that's Scotty, man. That's and Scotty. just gets better with time and all those songs. That's Scotty. Oh, that's right. That's Finally, Scotty. in the mood, yeah. Scotty. In the mood, that's Scotty. Okay. Because, but but then sorry, why? Sorry for telling the truth, y'all. No, we appreciate it. 
but I just always wanted to know why when they sing, I've never seen just one person sing that song. It's it always both of them together. I Is it know, the gimmick? Right? It's that's the gimmick, the gimmick, right? Yeah, it's that's the, gimmick. the showbiz. Piece the showman, yeah, 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 yeah. That's okay. what that is. Did Dick Griffey was that? Did he react to when you got that big hit? Did he say something to you about? It? I was curious because you was hitting some duds. So that's um, according to him. Yeah, I don't remember. I I really don't remember it though because we had another hit at the same time that he wasn't very happy about. Which I was what, a girlfriend. Right? It was called Girlfriend. Oh, Girlfriend. I would have, I would have and it was on oh. Pebbles. And it was on a competing label, MCA. Yeah. And so he I wasn't felt, friends with Lou Silas? I, I felt more uh I felt more shade from Dick about doing that than I did uh congratulations for making rock steady. <laughs> Damn. Yeah. Okay. All right. As a matter of fact, I remember him coming to visit me once and, and I was like, hey man, just made this record on Paul Abdul. Wanna hear it? He's like, no, I actually I don't. <laughs> oh, boy. I love you, man. I ain't gonna lie. And I don't say that like I'm trying to be protective of reputationally or anything. Like I really love the man because he was the first record executive I ever met. So the whole idea of being a record executive, I was heavily influenced by him. Yeah. Right. Uh and and watching him make decisions and kind of how and why and you know, some of the things he would say to me, you know, so it was really, it was really uh, a good, and he was impressionable, but we had a really good relationship. Do you uh, remember, I was thinking about this today about Dick. Do you remember something that you took with you from being with him that you learned and something that you said, I ain't taking that with me when I do what I do? Uh, oh, that, wait a minute. As far as things I didn't want to take? I've yet to hear yeah, you is hang this... somebody out the window. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I don't, I didn't, it's, it's, there's a lot I didn't take. Okay. You know, uh, and there's, there's some lot. things that you Good did. Good answer. Good answer. <laughs> there's, yeah, there's, there's some things that I definitely uh, took with me. Um, he called me once and he said, let me ask you something. You seem to know everything. Why are you still living in Cincinnati? I said, it's our hometown. You were still living in Cincinnati? I was living in Cincinnati when we made our first two albums. Okay. Right. Wow. Okay. And he said, you can make more money by accident in Los Angeles than you can make on purpose in Cincinnati. <laughs> Two weeks later, I lived in LA. Uh, <laughs> oh my God. Now I gotta know why you why you left and went to Atlanta. Oh, okay. I know yeah. we're not going that far yet, but that's, that's still, that's we're, still, we're, that's we're still, going there. Yeah. Still, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so just in that in that initial period, um, how are because the thing is, it's like the deal guys never truly left us because I see different combinations of their names and all the as song songwriters, writers. as producers yes. or musicians. Yeah. So how, what is, what is the adjustment of Ooh. sort of dissolving the deal and you and L, you and Babyface starting your own unit mm. and like, is it, is it church and state? Do you guys have your own management, your own, like, are you now prioritizing working in the studio with these artists and then the group later? Like, how's how's this working out? When I think back on it, um, and maybe I've never thought about it this way, um, but when I think back on it, I can see how the other members of the group could really be unhappy with the choices that we made, right? Although, they ultimately benefited everybody. In that moment, I could see how the other members of the group weren't very happy um, because um, one, one of the things was they liked Cincinnati, mm -hmm. my other guys, right? And they're still my friends to this day, right? But they liked Cincinnati and Kenny and I didn't. We had no desire to be in Cincinnati and Kenny didn't even like Atlanta that much, right? I mean, he liked it, but like he didn't he he didn't live there very long. Uh, he preferred living in Los Angeles, and you know, and he was a very ambitious and very talented man, uh, and is is and you know. Uh, but the other guys kind of were a little bit more homebodies, mm -hmm. so they weren't as ambitious. And and was there an opportunity for them to join the fray? Like, who's coming with me? Who's coming with me? Or was it sort of like, 
Nah, we're I think, just I think after, I'm trying to remember exactly how it took place, but I feel like after the last tour, yeah, the last tour we did, everybody kind of went their separate ways without a conversation. Like um, Kenny and I, after the tour was over, we decided to move to Atlanta with my, um, Pebbles was my girlfriend at the time, right? Mm -hmm. And we all decided, and Daryl Simmons, who is wow. Kenny's best friend and a really, really talented songwriter and producer and song. musician. Yeah, yeah. Straight up. Um, he decided to move to Atlanta with us and K.O. went to Atlanta with us, but Carlos and D, who were our other lead singers, they went back to Cincinnati. Wait a minute. I'm so, okay. It's so weird that you're telling this story because when I was watching uh, New Edition uh, headline the Essence Festival, I was sitting there just marveling at the fact that the, the, Michael of the group, right. the leader of the group, really didn't get his moment in the sun the way that it should have been. Right. You know, because even the, in the way that they craft their show is literally like just the best mixtape ever of right. their 40 years. Um, and, you know, not not even throwing shade, but yes, I, sensitivity was probably mm -hmm. the 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 slowest part of the night, even though it was a straight up hit. Oh. Right. But no, That's no, no, right. No, 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 no. But it, it was. I know like, what you I mean. Mean, By that point, it was like 19 hits. They they already did 19 hits. It was like, damn, I gotta go to the bathroom. Sensitivity. All right, all right. Let me take. Right, right. <laughs> Sensitivity is the time where it's like, all right, let me sit down because I know poison's about to come up. I gotta rest my. Right, right, right. But I, I was like, I was trying to wonder in history, was there ever a case where the lead singers sort of faded in the background while everyone else in the unit got to. Wow. Do that. So I always wanted to know what did D, what did they do once, like in 1989, 1990? Like, did they well, try their hand at songwriting? Did they try producing? They 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 made a couple of records as the deal because um mm -hmm. after although we all went our separate ways, they they did keep the unit together and they toured some. Uh they did some dates in Japan mm -hmm. and um they did a few dates here and there. They would work on weekends, as uh, at, that, at least that's what I understand. Um, and they went out and found a couple of guys that could do the job, you know, and they worked. They've been working. But they also, they they took nine to five jobs. Yeah. But uh, but then D got very lucky because D actually, D, D Bristol, he actually is the guy that wrote the chorus I only think of you on two occasions. That's day and night. He wrote that. So uh, years later, Mariah Carey used it on "We Belong Together." So uh, he saw nice. the money he still saw comes in. Money still comes in. Yeah. Yes, she did. Okay, so uh, I'm I'm gonna turn what could be a nine-hour show. Okay, we're gonna cut. And, we're gonna and short to, circuit. Oh no! Well, I'm I'm just gonna ask <laughs> you, just in general, just in general. Between 1987 and 1991, I mean, goddamn, you had at least like 60 plus hits, top 40 hits. What is like is what is, what is the not even the division of labor, but just in terms of that much volume? What does your life look like? Right. <laughs> yeah, like how. To me, are you bespoking these songs? Is it like Jermaine comes to town and you're like talking to him? Okay, here's a song called Don't Take It Personal. You're meeting TLC for the first time. It's like, okay, well, uh, let me see a baby, baby. Like, are these songs sort of like in the stash somewhere in the back? And you're like, um, would you like okay. this? Would you like this? Or are you custom making these songs? Some of those songs were custom made. Some of those songs, you got to remember, first of all, Kenny Edmonds is one of the most prolific songwriters ever. So mm -hmm. he has a war chest of material that's unreal. Like I, you know, sometimes I want to call and say, man, let me just go through the tapes. Like really, because uh, he's so prolific. That's, that's the first thing. So he always had something, but then when we, 
like if if it were uh, Bobby Brown, sometimes we would start things from scratch. Whitney Houston, we would start songs from scratch uh, where we're thinking about the artist. Uh, but then every now and then he would pull a song out that he'd had for a long time. And I'm Ready, he gave to Tevin Campbell, which is one of my favorite songs. And it had been around for like mm. 10 years or better. Well, I think wow. he, might have, he okay. might have had that song when I met him, seriously. Okay. Like I remember it that long ago, um, it, like in the first, the first chapter of our relationship as 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 musicians and friends, I remember hearing "I'm Ready" on a demo. Um, so so there was a backlog of material, but then we we would work on things. End of the road was I don't think end of the road was written for Boys to Men, but once it was done, it was pretty obvious. So I knew who to call. Mm -hmm. um, or I remember. Uh, how do you Kenny, know how to match a song to an artist? Um. I don't know. I don't really know, but I think that that's what A and R really is: is artist and repertoire, right? Finding the artist and the repertoire to match it. When it's particularly when it's people that um, maybe either they don't write songs or or they collaborate or they accept outside songs, and we tended to work with people who accepted outside material. We didn't like it that much working with people who could also write because it always changed how we would write, right? Um, and we had a thing that we liked to do. And we thought of ourselves as, we thought we were the deal and whoever was singing was the lead singer, right? But it was like, every song was, I'm your baby tonight is the deal featuring Whitney Houston. That's how we always looked at it, right? <laughs> or my, my, my is the deal featuring Johnny Gill or, you know, uh, because me and Kenny and KO and Daryl basically played on everything. Yeah you know, um, or programmed or however you want to look at it. We created all of the music for it. Um, uh, and we didn't really like tampering. So I remember once we were doing Jermaine Jackson and we, we finished some records and then he brought in his keyboard player to like reproduce all the songs. And we were like, what's this? And the dude was, and, and I forget his name now, he's really talented, but it was just changing everything. And it was, I was like, no, this doesn't work. No, no. I said, we'll keep that solo we did. That's the best we could do. The best ever. <laughs> you know? At work, at Saturday Night Live, whenever comedians, stand-up comedians host the show, uh, they try to bring their team in to try to right. write for them. Right. And it never works. It's always Doesn't best work. when you just trust the system and let the producers yes. or let the writers do it. So of, of, of for that initial... Uh, gust of of ellie face la faced him mm -hmm. what song almost didn't make it oh man let me see almost at, at least a, a a staple that we know um I don't know. I think we were way too greedy and ambitious man we were trying to get everything out like when I don't I don't recall that one I don't have a good answer to that one. Okay. Um, you guys produced Pebbles, and you also produced Karen White's first record. Right. Wow. First, first album. Yep. Wow. Amazing results. Yeah. Second album. Why didn't Karen White? Now I knew at the time she's dating Terry Lewis. Why didn't you guys work on the second Karen White record? Or was that a Benny Medina thing? Uh, oh, um, oh, no, that definitely wasn't a Benny thing. Uh, oh, wait a minute. He was there. Yeah. It was. <laughs> it was a Benny thing. Oh, hold, hold it. So, ah, okay. You know, Benny is like, Benny is, Benny is like my big, best friend. Wait, wait, time out, time out. But uh, wait, wait, let me ask Fonte. All right. For the life of you, can you sing the first? And I know Jam is going to kill me for this, but even I got him to admit this. Can you name? Can you sing the first verse of a romantic? No, dude. Did hey. you know that romantic actually went to number one? Yeah, I believe that was on the radio hard though. Wow, yeah. was it? Yeah. romantic wow. was a number one wow. pop hit. Yeah, it's on the radio hard. Look yeah, at Fonte's face right now. Exactly. Yeah, I yeah, exactly. I, I remember the hook. Let's get romantic. Time to no. get romantic. Oh, oh, romantic. Oh, yeah. 
Exactly. Y'all all singing the wrong romantic. It's, get- my whole point, <laughs> it's not it's my time whole- to get romantic. Okay. My whole point is that, yes, even though they managed to get a number one pop single off that Karen Wright White record. There was no mm-hmm. impact. I couldn't name no cut for the life of me. And my thing is, like, if it's not broke. Now, again, my my assumption is she married Terry Lewis. So it's sort of like, is this bring your husband to work day or whatever? But I I wouldn't have. That would mean Pebbles couldn't make records for nobody. No, no, I think it was. I think you nailed it. Okay, so. For entertainment, I have to tell you this story, just for entertainment Beautiful. sake. And, I'm not, and I'll go quickly. No, we love this. So we're in New Orleans, where you are now. There used to be a show called the Budweiser Superfest. Uh, yes. yes, we and know. Al we're, on the, we're on the Al tour. Heyman. Al Heyman, thank yes. you. And we're on the package doing uh, our final tour with two occasions. And, and Pebbles is with us. She's not on the tour, but she's hanging out with me. Her tour ended. She's just hanging with me. Benny Medina invites us to a Warner Music um, conference that they're having in New Orleans, right? And all the labels like Warner, Electra, Atlantic, all the labels and all the big executives who I didn't know at the time, Steve Ross and Bob Krasnow and David Geffen and Quincy Jones and Doug Morris and Jimmy Ivey, all these, I, I, I didn't know any of them. Anyway, so Benny invites us because we happen to have one of their hottest records, uh, Superwoman, with Karen White at the time. So he invites Babyface and I to the conference. So we're like, great. So we we go to the conference, and I walk. We walk in, and it's Babyface, Pebbles, and myself. And I don't know record company politics or anything like that. Benny comes running over to us and says, "I invited you, and I invited you." And he points to Pebbles and he says, but I did not invite her. And I'm like, well, if she can't come, then I don't want to be here. Cause, and I don't get it. I don't, and, and we turn around and leave. And we, and, and we wow. fall out. And Benny and I don't speak for a decade, wow. right? And 10 years later, he told me it was because LA, I was seating you guys with Karen White and it's her moment. And her competition is Pebbles, and you bring <laughs> Pebbles in, and you're gonna put her at the same table, like. And I was like, "Oh, I thought you were just being an asshole. I didn't realize I was, I was, at, I was wrong here. I didn't know, I didn't know. So, so I didn't speak to Benny for a decade, and we never worked with Karen again. Wow. Yeah. Finally, an answer I'm satisfied with because it's like, why ruin the all formula? Answers. Why right. ruin the answers. formula? Exactly. And we loved working with Karen, like loved it. And we had fun doing it, right? She was fun. She could sing. She had a great Mm -hmm. tone, great voice. And she was like a real musician type of singer. You know, she had some, you know, she knew music. She knew about, you know, Sly and the Family Stone, things that we liked. She knew about, by the way, the end of Superwoman, ever so slightly like Purple Rain. (laughs) Oh, with the strings and... And the ooh, 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 and the ooh, 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 ooh. Ooh, 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 ah. ooh, ooh, ooh. Ever nice. so slightly. Nice. Oh, oh that's, that's the stories yeah, I like. You got that. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay, so at, you know, I, I, we were first introduced to you as kind of solar house producers. Yes. One, how did that phase end? It almost looked like you had a, a universal MCA situation about to happen. Yes. And then the next thing I know, everything's happening on Arista. Now, when you're doing a roster, when you're when you're producing for these artists, is it a contractual thing? Are you allowed to do other people? Or is it like once right. you start the Arista phase, you must stick to Arista and Arista only? No, it wasn't. It wasn't exactly that. It started out that we were solar in-house producers for sure. And um, and after after the whispers took off and the deal and Babyface had hits, uh, Lil Silas, we became friends with Lil and Cheryl Dickerson at, at both of them and Gerald Busby. We became friends with the MCA crew and we went over and started 
helping them. We did the Mac band for them. One of my favorite songs we ever did was Roses Are Red Roses by are Mac Band. Yeah. yeah, and it feels underrated. It feels like no, no one knows it, you know, but uh, I, I really dig that. And we end up doing Pebbles for them. And you did the boys as well. And we did the boys. Yeah. And, and, um, no, yeah, so to men. At, later when when it became Motown, we did Boys to Men. So uh, wait, it, 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 no label CEO is making you guys sign an exclusive contract to no. stay with just like it never occurred to Dick Griffey to say you guys are my house producers only. I think I I did sign a contract with with Solar for to be an exclusive in house producer, uh, but I never got I never got the money, so I never honored it. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah, you know, uh, he didn't hold me to it. I didn't hold him to it. We were like, and it wasn't for that much money. And uh, um, but yeah, so so we worked with with Lou for a while, and then Benny Medina called. No, someone called us and asked us to meet Benny Medina. So we went over and we met him, and we said, "Who's on your roster?" And he named Al Jarreau. We were like, "Nah." Right. He, says, he says Chaka Khan, who was my favorite singer, but I was like. I don't know how we could do any better than I feel for you, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and then he said, Karen White. And I remembered hearing her on the radio singing, these are the facts, facts of love. Of love. Yeah. And I was like, oh, we could do something with that, right? And so that's how it worked out. So yes, um, we were supposed to do LaFace Records with MCA. It wasn't Universal yet, it was MCA. And Irving Azoff ran the company. Yeah. And uh, Gerald Busby had already departed to start Motown, to take over Motown. And uh, Lou was still there also. What and, was Lil Silas Jr. like, just as an executive? Oh, my God, man. And, uh, like, really, a lot of energy. Like, re- a lot of energy. He knew his records. Like, you know, he was a, he was a DJ, too, you know. Uh, and he remixed every song that came out. Like, every single song that came out, at that time, he would remix. He would remix guy records, anything. Every See, I song. thought he was just slapping his name on on those productions. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize that he. Was no, he had a crew. He had a team of people. He had an engineer. He had a programmer, and and it was him. And he would take all the records that he liked. He would take them in and do the remix of them. You know, and and sometimes they'd be harder when he's done with them. Like not every time, but sometimes they would be hard. But he was a lot of fun. Really competitive. And at that time in 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 black music in in LA, there were like these three superstar uh, A and R guys. One of them was Lil Silas Jr. The other one was John McClain, who was at A and M. We was, that's our dream interview. We can't find him for Jack. Oh, he's the, the greatest. And then there was Benny Medina, who was at Warner, right? But these are like the three stars in town, um, and. You know, and I, they, I became friends with all of them, and it was really great. But Lou was great, man. He was fun. That's what's up. He was great. Great dude. So, great all dude. right. With once, where, where's the point? Because I asked Jimmy Jam this question as well, which is, all right, both of you are, whoa, whoa, whoa. before I even get to that, I got to ask the Whitney question. At the time when I first, I think when I heard uh, uh, Donnie yeah. Simpson make the announcement that Whitney Houston is going to work with Ellie and Face, I got slightly nervous. Oh, wow. Rightly. Because the thing is that, you know, the Whitney train was, you know, and I'm not saying anything that that isn't facts. You know, she definitely it was it was overkill. We, we all know about the booing at the Soul Train Awards and all those things. Right. And I often wondered if placing her in your hands was almost a setup for a disaster. Because the thing is, like, the first album sells 12 million and the second album sells 15 million. So there's like in meeting with Clive Davis, is he saying to yourself, like, don't fuck up like Y'all better give me another 10 to 15 million. And how how was the general what was the general consensus when I'm your baby tonight only did again? I don't consider it a, it did five a solid five million. 
Right. That's right. But it, but it wasn't what the first two albums were. And actually, I'm glad it wasn't what the first two records were. Right. But yeah, just can you walk too. us through that whole. Yeah. So the, I think that I think that didn't feel pressure, first of all, did not feel any pressure, um, didn't approach it that way. He was very clear that Whitney had a black problem. So his goal wasn't, I want to sell 15 million. His goal was ingratiate my artist with the black community, please. Like stand beside her, work with her because they don't think she's cool, right? And so success was simply um, black people saying, okay, wait. Be the jam. Yeah. Right. And that, that, that's that, that did it. it. And that did that's it. all it was. So, and, and so we didn't feel any pressure yeah. And we knew we couldn't be, I'm being honest, we knew we couldn't make those kinds of records. Like right, those right. those big records that she had, like. Uh, well, we, yeah, okay, I get that. You know, like we didn't write like that. We didn't produce like that. But with they, ballads, they were, you could have, I think through a ballad, you could have reached those heights. Probably, right. Yeah, for but sure. My thing sure. is that in that in that time, in 1990, when New Jack Swing is going gaga and you guys are actually the proprietors I mean, the entire Don't Be Cool record is a tutorial and New Jack Swing them. Right. <laughs> but next to the, the Eyes of a Stranger record, I was so confused as to why a shuffle song was her first statement and claiming <laughs> her throne. But it worked. Like that. Yeah, it was perfect. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah, it, I, I, get I think it, it worked always, because it, the powers that be made it work. Everyone knew who L.A. and Babyface were. Everyone knew who Whitney Houston was. So it was and it like, was a great song. Let's be clear. I mean, yeah, I like, can I trust my ears a little bit? Oh, a little yeah, bit. yeah, yeah. Like the shit was a jam. Yeah. Okay, risky but as hell. it was just an risky unusual as hell. risky song. Okay. All right. Risky. It was risky. It was risky. risky. And uh, like, because could could DJs have played that in the nightclub? Like that that level of of shuffle. And 12 8 meter was like harking back to like Luther Vandross's bad boy having a party, which sure is That's it's right. more barbecue. Okay. Ah, watch out now. Like barbecue. Yeah. Yeah. And not every little step, not right on our right. own. Yes. Not girlfriend, right. not a straight ahead. No, no, it's a risk. In in hindsight, yeah. I will say it's the best move because. I love when risks work, but damn, yeah. yo, like why? But we also, you know what else it was? We had played ourselves out, like not to the public maybe, but we had played ourselves out with that sound and we, we had moved to Atlanta and we were experimenting because we were trying to rediscover, we were really trying to refine ourselves and we couldn't do the Dow My Heart again. We couldn't do... You know, we, we just couldn't do it anymore. Like we had done it so much on so many songs. Like every song had had that that kind of groove on it. And it was it just got tired, you know, for us. Um, and so I'm your baby tonight was um it was it was a little bit of us reinventing us as much as it was trying to give Whitney Houston something that we thought was unique. Yeah. I, I would have thought Susan would have probably, well, if Susan didn't have a, a direct pr proper noun attached to it, <laughs> I would have thought like, my name is not Susan would have been. Yeah. Right. But I think and that was what she needed. It reminded me a lot of Jimmy Jam's story of like doing with Janet and like, you know, if was the one on the Janet album, that was the right. one that was like Janet, the gimme just, you know, right. go. But that's the way Love Goals was the one that's like, oh shit. You know what I mean? Right. Like, you know, it's a different Damn. thing. You know, and Ooh. that's what that's they, what they almost went with it first. Yeah. They Damn. almost went with it just first. Around. And, and and to be honest, not to be that radio girl use this old, you know, logic, but they both sound like more female records. Like I'm your baby tonight is way more female, just like yeah, yeah. It's just it's just women. I was, really, like, I was really proud of it. I, am, yeah. I was so proud of that record when we finished it because it was we had never done a shuffle. We had, we hadn't did we no no songs like that, and I was proud of. I was just proud of it, and it and it didn't matter to me the success of it. And and I know that sounds like uh, I'm being a little bit frivolous about it, but. It was more like, can we tackle Whitney Houston and do something with Whitney that hasn't been done already? Because we can't do what she's done better than she's done it. 
So can we do something that's just our take on it? And we did that successfully. Um, and I was very happy with it. And yeah, also, I and I'm going to lie, I really do like the drum feels on it. <laughs> <laughs> no, in hindsight, I think it's a great normalizing. It, it, it normalized her, mm -hmm. made her relatable and down yeah. to earth. That was what and, it was for. Mm -hmm. you know, because the, the, the joints I liked on the first record were like the Kashif records and that that's. Oh, of man. Thing. Uh, and it didn't have its, it didn't have any sugar pop on it, which. Right. I'm glad. But we had a little problem that we never discussed. I never talked to Kenny about it, but we did Whitney and we did Michael and our Michael stuff never came out because we couldn't nail it. We spent a lot of time with Michael and we just couldn't nail it. And, wow. and we spent a lot of time with Whitney and we were able to get a little bit off, but for some reason, those are big stars because that wasn't our thing. Our thing was the artist of our generation. Like our, that's what we were great at. If we were great at anything, it was like, let's work with Bobby Brown. You know, let's work with Pebbles. Let's do Babyface. Let's do, you know, Karen White. Let's do our, our crew right. after seven, even like our, okay. our crew. But when we went outside of our circle and tried to do those superstars, the truth is we did not nail it. We did not nail it. Now we got something off with Whitney and we developed an incredible relationship with her uh, that would last for many years. But it none of those, it didn't resemble the success that we'd had, not sound wise, not signature wise, not impact wise. And it was the first, and you're right, because it was the first time that you could criticize whether it was actually the right thing. And after that, we did Michael and, and, I mean, we couldn't even get out of the studio with a song, man. Damn. Like, and and we knew how to write and we knew how to produce, but there was something about being in that room with Michael that we just were overshooting it and trying too hard and just could not get any, nothing felt natural. So how hard was it to walk away from the Dangerous record knowing that, damn, we couldn't do it? It, it, what we just knew it like when we went home when we left the studio after being in there for a month and when oh we went wow home, it was a month yeah oh and, shit. on one yeah. song no we 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 attempted to write several songs and he and he recorded two he recorded background vocals on one never finished it and he completed one never mixed it the and slave to the rhythm song right slave to the rhythm yeah so and, did anything happen to those other songs that were meant for him? Uh, no. No, they're just sitting, they're sitting somewhere. I think they might be in, in my vault. Um, yeah, I think oh. they might be in my vault because I, I, that's where I found Slave to the Rhythm at. You know, I because we didn't do Slave to the Rhythm with Sony. We did that with Michael. We didn't do it as a, a higher at a record label. That was a relationship just between us and Michael. Uh, so we all kept we kept our tapes. So was that a teachable lesson in or make you leery of those A-list stars? Like, because I'm certain by that point, everybody was calling you. Like, who yeah. did you who would you say no to? Um, A-list. Well, Kenny became much better at it. OK. Right. Because he did Madonna successfully and he did Eric Clapton successfully. And okay. so he became he nailed it. Uh, I went the other way, which was um, signing. I only, I only wanted to work with the artists that we signed that we were signing. I didn't want to work with anybody you, you else. You signed. You were like, I'm going to manufacture the next ten million sellers. Yes, I'm doing that. So I just went into that mode. And um, so, what was yeah. the realization point where it's like, hey, office life? Like, how, who does that? Who wants? <laughs> who? Who? wants to be a rock star and then says or question. did you realize early that all of the power and the money and the success and the magic yeah. is behind it wasn't that you know what it was for me it was the, it was really the love of music man it was because i loved music not only the music that kenny and i made but when i met people like dallas austin or when i met like not just people i work with but when i would meet other producers 
Mm-hmm. I would love their music. Like I love Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis are like my favorite producers. Leon Silvers is my favorite, you know, amongst my favorite producers. And uh, when when Nelly Hooper did Soul to Soul, like I met him and I was like taking and uh, uh, Martin Nelly, I met him at Clarence Avon's house. And I just I love the people that made music. So I didn't want a career that was based on the music that I made. I didn't think I was good enough for that. I wanted to be a career that I could work with people that I thought were uh, immensely talented. So my career decisions had only to do with music. It had nothing to do with power. It had nothing to do with money. It was a pure love of, damn, I love how Dallas does this. I love how Jermaine Dupree does that. Oh my God, these kids organize noise. They do this and they do, it was purely my love of music and my love of artistry. Right. And I like the idea of like when we met Pebbles, no one knew who she was and we made her record and it worked. And so and when we did Karen White, no one knew who that was. I mean, she had one song on the radio, but she wasn't famous, so to speak, mm-hmm. or 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 our own band, The Deal or Babyface. Or, so I was so into homegrown and I felt comfortable in homegrown and I felt uncomfortable having to measure up to stars. But you realize that once you get behind that desk, your your Jedi mind trick knowledge has to go into overdrive. Because I'm certain by that point, like when you're having your own label, you try to you got to talk people out of a lot of bad decisions. <laughs> right. Like you you got to take meetings and you got to remember names and bad cop, bad cop and go what to things like. Jack the Rapper and and whatever and right. shake hands and kiss babies, like who would trade? Like, for- I think it's for the <laughs> stage that you are in your life. Like I had, like I was my group little brother. We were signed to uh, Atlantic, you know, a year. Yeah, and uh, and you know Julie Greenwald. We would have conversations, and you know she would say like, you know, we had a convo recently, and she was just talking about how at this point in her career, she enjoys kind of being in the stage kind of, you know, where you are and just all the OGs in the game where they're able to kind of sit back and see the whole big picture and kind of direct from that standpoint. So being and, in the room where it happens is more yeah, like that's, yeah, that's the thing. And I get it. It makes total sense, you know, versus when you're, you know, in your LA and Babyface days where you're actually kind of in the field, so to speak, like where you're in the studio, you're programming the drums, whatever. Now you get to kind of be the big picture guy and assemble all the people. Yeah. You know I mean? There's one thing I learned about it that I that I do love, um, and uh, being being an executive, and it had to do with t- choices about artists and records, and um, like the great the ones I love that I consider the great Barry Gordy, obviously being number one on on that side of the ledger, right? As an executive. Um, Clive Davis, I obviously love and respect Jimmy Iovine, Ahmed Erdogan, and there are others, you know, uh, but what I loved is if they were passionate about something, they could drive it. And to your point, right? Like you, I think you kind of called it manufacturing, but it was more like if you have this intuition or this instinct that this gut that something is the thing and to just drive it through. Okay. We right. believe in it. Like, like, I, yeah. That belief thing, I like I like that. I don't see much of that these days. I really don't. Like with um I, I see people really having to have data to back up their decisions as oh, opposed yeah. to having a gut. Oh, yeah. Right. And oh, I God. like the fact that you know we did it with our gut and we were wrong a lot of times, but we were right enough times that we are considered successful, right? Um and I like that, and I like that particularly for black artists, because black artists don't often get an opportunity to get a crossover shot, a shot to the mainstream. That is all because like Whitney Houston is because Clive Davis said, this is for the masses. Rihanna is because I said, this is for the masses, Damn right? right. Um, that, and I, but did you realize that that person you were signing was God in the making? When you signed Rihanna, mm-hmm. I mean, she's now God status. Like there's, yeah, she's literally past, she's past the Vanguard level. Like in my mind, Rihanna would have just been like, 
maybe Janet Jackson level where she just has 20 hits under her belt, but she's yeah. now past that point. I can't say I knew all that. Maybe Jay Brown knew it. Maybe Jay Z knew it, right? Because obviously all of us were involved together. Uh, I can't say that. When I first saw her and I heard her first Ponder replay, Jay Brown brought it to me one night in, in the office. It was really late at night. And I was like, I guess. Right. That was my reaction. I was like, Wait, I guess. It's, it's right, Caribbean, can, can too. Because it's Caribbean, too. So it's like. Can I ask one question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I forget at the time because this is also the period where we were about to sign to the label. Yeah, I remember uh -huh. once. I remember once going to a J show. Rihanna was there, and you Rita said, Ora. "What's her name?" Rita Ora. Yeah, no, 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 no not the... Rita Ora. Tierra was... Marie. Tierra Marie. There you go. Yeah. All right. Now the energy that I felt in the room oh, when damn. I was backstage was Tierra Marie was going to be out of the smash. One hundred percent. Yeah, and Rihanna got the cute little hit, and she'll yeah. probably get on like now that's she'll be in the malls. Her, her song will play in the malls. Yes, right. I thought she's gonna be on that. Now that's what I call music volume 37. Yeah, yeah. and the opposite happened. Yeah. So how how does it again? Is that Jedi mind tricking where you have to know who your artist is? Like, how long do you get to absorb an artist to know? what they need in order to make it happen. Right. So I think this, first of all, I think this helps answer one of your other questions. Yes, we really believed in Tia Marie, all of us. Good. She got the Rockefeller chain, all of it. Yes, we believed did. in her. Yeah. It didn't work. I love her as a person. I saw her not long ago, but it didn't, it didn't connect at all. The songs didn't connect. The artists didn't really connect. And um, so, no, you can't force it. You could you can you could prioritize it and you can try, but you can't you can lead the horse to water, but you cannot make them drink. Right. It doesn't it didn't work. Rihanna, on the other hand, um, I grew I grew into it personally. Like I remember when it hit me. I, rem I remember really well when it hit me um, sitting in the house one night and listening to the demos and. You know, Jay Brown, Tata and those guys, they they were making her records like and they were giving them to me to listen to. Um, and I remember sitting at home listening to Good Girl Gone Bad and all these songs. I came back and said, wait a minute, guys, we should call it album that we should call it album Good Girl Gone Bad. Right. And uh, it, it was like it was a statement. Anyway, my point is. It all of a sudden hit me that she was it. And then she did this song called SOS. Mm. And I watched the video for SOS. Mm -hmm. And I took it home. I told my wife, Erica, I was like, this girl's about to be the biggest star in the country, if not the world. Watch this video. And we watched the video. And she was like, okay, I get it. And then she made Umbrella. Mm over with and when she I made mean, umbrella yeah. i was just, i then did i do i know do i have an instinct do i have an intuition in those moments yes because yeah. i knew <laughs> that was out of here i was like yeah she's gone right yeah. okay you get a song like umbrella you get jay-z on that song can you walk us through the process of what it takes to make that song connect with an artist like how do you, do you play it? Who do you play it for first? Who gets the, oh. the dream? Just bring it. Yeah, the, when the dreams process. Yeah. So no, no, that, no. I mean, creatively, I'm talking about uh, once you have album in hand. Okay. How do you ah. make sure that 12 up. billion people around the world know what Umbrella is? At the time, it's certain. It's a, it's it, there. There are more avenues now. Like it's the game has gotten pretty complicated, and it's and it's flooded flooded with stuff, right? Um, uh, from all these platforms and all this DIY and every the uh, very low barrier to entry. So there's a lot more stuff than there are than than there is special stuff. Yes, uh, in the game back in those days, a record executive can make a record of priority and. And, and put it on radio, all radio, and people will hear it. And 
and and and video video mattered right and mtv mattered and bet mattered and vh1 mattered right and so all of our, our all of our avenues and our platforms uh we had enough influence that we could get it a shot it still had to take off but our job was just to get it in front of the people um and that's what we did we got it in front of the people and it took off so does that also mean that your relationship has to be intact with i don't know who like ran mtv or viacom at the time or your relationship yeah. with uh whoever runs clear channel or yes yeah it absolutely means that yes yeah absolutely those contacts are are golden they really are i mean and we try to always keep them and even with the changing of guards right we we're, we're right there to you know hail the new king or hail the yeah. new queen mm -hmm. uh but the relationships are golden but it's also the artist relationships with these people and with these gatekeepers you know uh they they also have to have their own they have to do the work mm -hmm. we can't do the work for an artist an artist has to do that you know yep. so it's it's you knowing tom you know uh polman it's you knowing you know john sykes and it's it's you know what i mean it's it's you Steven knowing hill. Stephen hill or calderon at mtv or yeah. jesse collins or whoever it might it's you knowing everybody also uh and that has a lot of i think that has a lot of of, of weight so even now like does it get tiring to have to know names and what they represent and oh how do you keep up la it's exciting i'm the worst at that shit. okay because it's more no, than it's ever it's it's more than it's ever it's exciting right? though now okay. i love that i absolutely okay. love the challenge of that like i okay. and 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 my memory is horrible i mean you can ask me anything about the 80s i remember it but anything from like 2011 forward i barely remember i don't know why but uh but i really like the idea of it i mean once i embraced being an executive i did have a goal and my goal was to be the best just at the time in 88 89 i wouldn't have thought hey atlanta, atlanta is a great place to build my empire what did you see in atlanta that i i we didn't see because at the time the only artist i knew that lived in atlanta was Peebo bryson and mm -hmm. then you changed everything. You changed the whole culture of a city. Yeah. So how Talk did about you, it. why did you choose Atlanta and oh man, that's fun. How, how did you choose that's Atlanta? Dope. Why that's and fun. How? so it was a combination. It was myself, Babyface, and Pebbles. All three of us were in the studio uh on Kawanga Boulevard in a studio called Ilumba. And we collectively decided that we wanted to leave. We wanted to move out of L.A. Uh, for various reasons. Um, okay. Why? One, one was um, we, we were concerned about earthquakes. Seriously. I, I know it sounds kind of crazy. Um, uh, we were concerned about cost of living. Okay. And we had just started to make some money and we wanted to know how to stretch that. Right. Uh, and uh yeah and we so so the idea was let's and we just come off tour like we just finished that last tour and we've been all over the country and we didn't think la was like the only place on earth so we had a conversation about moving so we put a map on the wall we had a very serious conversation about moving. Yeah, that's what to say. You put a map out. Very hey, serious conversation. Coming to America. <laughs> we put a map on the wall, <laughs> uh, a, a, a map of the United States. And first we looked at everyone's hometown. Where should we go? Should we go to the Bay Area where Pebbles is from? Oh, nah. I thought she was from Atlanta. Damn. Oh, she's from the Bay. We were like, nah. Wow. We took Indianapolis where Babyface is from. Nah. Nah. Cincinnati, where I'm from, nah. I don't even want to be there. I left. <laughs> right. I don't either. Then we were like, New York. Nah. And then Kenny, we thought about our experiences being in New York and writing, and we were like, nah, we don't write that well in New York. Nah. We got it. Dallas. Mm. Big homes, big, great lifestyle. Mm. Mm. One of us, and I don't remember who said Atlanta, and all I remember, all of us saying, yes, because wow. Atlanta, if you're on tour, when you go through Atlanta, that's like, that's like, a, it was like the Mecca, right? Everything was like, 
upscale. It was like everything from the um, pre Olympics. Oh yeah, this was in oh, like eighty eight. Eighty eight. This is eighty eight. Yeah. yeah, I mean the Olympic. They didn't even have skyscrapers. I you mean, guys and Bobby Brown. I'll never understand. Like yeah, we all went like together. Why yeah. would y'all do that? We picked Atlanta because we knew we could live well. I'm being wow. honest, right? Yeah. We just knew we could live. We went down, looked at some houses, and the house prices, the real estate prices, like we were like, we can live, we can live well down here. This place is dope. So we I called Irving Azoff, who was running MCA at the time, who we thought we were gonna make the LaFace deal with. And I said, Irving, I have an idea. He said, What's the idea? I said, How's this sound? Motown of the South. Ooh. the face records atlanta georgia and he said where do i sign mm. and that's how it started and he gave us the seed money to move book the planes book the hotels found us a lawyer found us a real estate agent and, and we went down and we literally stayed there until we found homes wow and where did clive davis come in the picture the <laughs> irving quit irving irving's quit working at mca Oh, he, he left the company. Right. And the, his predecessor uh, uh, or his successor, I'm sorry, uh, wasn't that interesting to us. So Clarence. So enter Clarence Avon. Yes. Godfather. So Clarence Avon, who has always say, been there. Right. Clarence says, well, if you're not doing it with Irving, then I'm going to introduce you to Jerry Moss, David Geffen. Uh, and all of the various players, and we met everybody, and everybody was interested. Mo Austin, we mm. met everybody. How did you get out the contract, though? You signed on the dotted line, no? No, we didn't sign anything. We just got a producer advances because we made all of our hits at MCA, so we had a lot of money in the pipeline. So he just basically gave us the money that we were owed. And you didn't have to recoup it we didn't back, sign or anything. back or anything? We never signed one thing. No. Wow. Um, no, we didn't sign anything. We just, and, and it was a lot of money, you know, especially at that time. I can imagine, yeah. You know, um, so Clarence introduced us to everybody. And when I was 18 years old, I read this book by this great record executive named Clive Davis. The Yellow Book. <laughs> I'm like, I don't even know why. I don't even know why 18, 19 years old. Why am I reading about a record executive? I didn't even know why. But there was a photo of him sitting at the Beverly Hills Hotel pool with Sly and the family, with Sly Stone. And I was like, I want to be that guy, right? Not Sly, I want to be the guy sitting next to Sly, right? Uh, so this is my big opportunity to meet the great Clive Davis. And Clarence set it up. We walked into the bungalow at the Beverly Hills Hotel to meet Clive Davis. And my mind was already made up. I was like, I'm doing this with Clive. But I couldn't say that. I couldn't play. I couldn't show the hand. And I didn't actually know how Face felt about it at the time. You know, I knew Face really wanted to work on Whitney. Um, so it just all felt right. Uh, but we thought we were going to do it with David Geffen, who said, yes to our deal and then he came back and said actually no i don't want to do it and his reasoning was i'm not committed to the genre it wasn't bad at all it was very honest he was like i'm a rock guy he ain't waste your time he didn't waste that time. He's like, that's funny. I mean, damn right. He wasn't because yeah, we were just, his guinea pigs. <laughs> that's what i was thinking. I was like, that's what i was thinking. Yeah. Oh wow! So, now I'm just so thinking, anyway. Like, wow, I could have signed the label. I could have signed the Laface in 1993 if Wendy Goldstein had just went to. <laughs> like I'm now imagining the alt alternate lifetime where Outcast needs help, and the Roots are the ones oh my are, god, <laughs> and the Roots are the ones. That are oh, that's hot. That's actually really hot. That's hot. Man. That's hot. Uh, I have a while we all, I have a very specific Outcast question. So um. I want you to talk about the differences in working with uh, between Dre and, and Big Boy. I really study Big Boy is somebody that I really look at and I look at a lot of the moves in his career and they seem to be a direct reflection of, you know, you know, his relationship with you. So I want to know he talks. He's always spoken very highly of you. And yeah, his, man, I love him you know so I mean? much. Yeah. So like, how have you how's that relationship between those two guys uh, over the years? How's that developed? Uh, it, it's always been really good. 
And, and the truth is, I think it might have been one of my better relationships because I didn't know their music as well. Like, like I couldn't tamper. Do you know what I mean? Uh-huh. Like if TLC makes a record, I have a very strong opinion about it or, or anybody, you know, uh, Usher makes a record. I have a very strong opinion about it. But with Outkast, they were such, they were such originals that if they felt passionately about it, my job was to be a servant leader instead of being, wow. uh, Instead of meddling. I have a question. Okay, am I the only one that thinks this, Fonte? As much as I love elevators. Okay. Dude, in 1996, to make your first single a very slow tempo song that's like 88 BPMs, not not conducive to what I believe dance culture was but in that was in the South, though. That, Atlanta. That was, yeah, that was Atlanta. a risky song. Right. That was such yeah. a risky song. In the yo. South for us, man, that was not our shit. It wasn't risky for us. We ran the fuck out of the elevators, like, immediately. Like Because when I got, way. like, by that point, I was, like, getting serviced by DJs and whatnot. And, yes, as a as an, as a Northeasterner, like, I was, I was in the groove of where hip-hop was in that period between, like, 92 BPMs and 100 BPMs, like, very fast pit. And... When I put elevators on, I just stared at the record like, you know, this is so yes. slow and spacey. Yeah. How am I going to wake, make this work in my DJ sets? And yet y'all went with it. Like there was no fear whatsoever. I actually didn't know one way or another. Like, to be honest with you, right? Andre and Big Boy and Rico Wade, they came to the office and they were like, this is it. This is it. This is it. And I knew Andre. What I did know is that that Andre verse was... Oh. We all knew that. I yeah. mean, that was like seriously, like, damn, he's good. He's really good. Um, but as a song, I probably had the same opinion you did. I was like, this is a little slow. It's not that clear either, you know. Like, it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't sparkling. It was dark, <laughs> right? And um, so I had the same. But but I really believed in. I really believed in Rico Wade. Like Rico Wade was the leader. Um, and 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 he was he was my ears man my eyes and my ears to to everything that that we were doing in that world of of outcast goody mob um um uh, and even you know parental advisory is yes you know, oh, yeah pa absolutely pa right they were they were in the crew as well so i just listened to rico and it worked and after it worked my relationship with them was you guys make your own decisions. I, if you want my opinion, I'll give you my opinion, but I'm not giving you my opinion unless you ask me. Is you, that still your relationship with big boy now? Cause y'all still yeah. like work. It's still to this day. Yeah. That's amazing. I do what he says. <laughs> okay. So without Rico's presence on speaker box, how do you trust your instincts? I mean, by this point they're they're now a marquee act. They're your A-listers. And without the muscle of of organized noise sort of under them, I mean, even though they're there right. somewhat, how shaky was it to navigate a double album of clearly two different sides? Right. And not only make it work, but make it one of their most, and, and to take them on stage. I was there that night. I couldn't believe that shit. Like they actually, so how much, how hard, not hard, or how worrisome were you to like go with your gut being the, I'm, I'm assuming that you're now manning the ship for at least that album. Yes. That you didn't have yes. to go there to guide you. Right. So things that kind of changed, they really grew into their, they really had grown into it. I mean, this was after Stankonia, mm-hmm. right. And, mm-hmm. and which was a massive success for them. Um, and I mean, the real story was it was Big Boy's solo album, mm-hmm. right? And it was complete and it was, it was done. And, and I heard, um, I like the way you move. So I felt confident that we had like a big single. Mm-hmm. And Andre called, cause they weren't working together. It's, I mean, this is fairly common. Yeah. knowledge mm-hmm. i think yeah. they weren't working together and andre called the office 
Reed, when are you dropping Big Boy's album? I gave him the date. He's like, <clears throat> so if I want to drop an album with that, how much time do I have? And I think I told him you got three weeks. He was like, three weeks. Ah. Okay. What? <laughs> Wait. So I don't know, know this story. Oh. Yeah. Where was he in the process? Says, what? Okay. Songs? I, what? I didn't what? know what he had recorded because he wasn't really talking about it at all. He wasn't talking about making a record. Big Boy was gone solo. We've already done a photo shoot. We've picked the single. We've put the date on the calendar. We're moving forward. And then I get that call from Andre. And he says, you know, how much time do I have? And that was the first time I had an indication that he wanted to make an album. We had not talked about it at all. And I told him three weeks. And I just remember him saying, ah, OK. And he hung up. He was probably done already. <laughs> it had to, so, be. had to be. All I remember is that on the night that we had to like turn the album in for parts so we could manufacture, mm -hmm. Andre has studios going everywhere. He had mastering going on. He had a couple of mix rooms going on. He had uh, he had an ensemble of studios going to make the deadline. He was working his ass off. I went to the studio to visit and um, heard some of the material, but uh, he finished it and sat down and played it for me. And I was, I could not believe what I was hearing, man. And and he played me Hey Ya. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my God. And and I didn't try to say, I didn't try to go into the like, okay, yeah, this is a smash. That, that, that wasn't how I reacted. I was more blown away that you actually did this in three weeks. And I felt like you did, like, yo, I, you must have had this. There's no way you did this in three weeks. Yeah, he, yeah, he did. Fonte it, has a theory, though. When Pete Rock was telling the story of how he made Public Enemies shut him down in 10 minutes. Oh, and yeah. And yeah. one of y'all said, like, because of the pressure, like, he didn't have time to overthink You're it. You're not thinking it. No, you just. Oh, yeah. 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 That's also Quincy. He talks about the, the, the alpha state. Like, he talks about that. Just Analysis, paralysis through analysis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, yes. just going. You're not thinking about it. You're just creating. That's so right. you you were actually you were presented with this scenario twice. And I always wanted to know how far did TLC get and in going with that initial thing where I believe Lisa suggested all three of us should make solo records. And oh, oh um not very far. Okay. <laughs> Honestly, not very far at all. Uh because t boss had made a couple of solo songs that for a soundtrack. I got to remember the soundtrack. Yeah, the kids think. I touched myself record. Uh, well, I touched myself. That's uh -huh. the song. You're right. That was, I remember that. Yeah. Oh, I was thinking about the, uh, that Rugrats thing, but. No, that was, that would have been after, but okay. so she did it. And it was pretty clear to me that it was the ensemble that was the magic, right? And mm -hmm. I love t boz Like, I mean, I love all of them, but I had a particular love for her style, that raspy voice, her kind of, her, she kind of approached it like a guy. She was the only girl I've seen approach it like a guy, but, but, uh, and I just, th I thought she was so dope. Um, but it was the ensemble that was the, the, the real winner there. And then Lisa made a solo album uh, before she passed away, um, may right. she rest in peace. I miss her so much. Um, she made a solo album and, uh, I, I wasn't blown away by it. I didn't think it was incredible mm -hmm. at all, you know, and it was, and it was, it was the kind of music I, sh I, I should, ha I should have loved it if mm -hmm. it were good. It wasn't like outside of my thing. The way I sort of describe Goody Mob as right. outside of my thing. So I got to defer to them. This wasn't outside of my sweet spot, but I just didn't think it was great. Yeah. And uh, Chili never actually tried to make a solo record that I can remember uh, until many, many years later. Uh, so okay. that one didn't get that one didn't go very far. How did you balance, you know, a record like Crazy Sexy Cool, where it's on your label, but you're also writing and producing <laughs> I didn't write and produce on it. 
You didn't do yeah, that wasn't you and Babyface together, like on no, no. I that was when that was the last time uh that I was a, a writer producer was uh seven whole days, Tony Braxton. Ah, okay, okay. That was you. the last time. And after and I did, and then I did a song that never made never saw the light of day with um Elton John that Elton called and asked me to produce. Oh, wow. Right. Um, and it was for a um a Curtis Mayfield tribute record it wasn't commercial at all. Elton yeah. was what spending was... time in Atlanta for a minute. I was like, "Were you the reason yeah, that Elton, Elton was, was spending in time a lot?" Yeah, um, but I stopped. I, I stopped, yeah. and uh, Kenny and I stopped working together. And I started spending too much time on the phone. I was transitioning into being an executive. I was I was learning how to how independent promotion worked. I was learning how marketing worked and I was so intrigued with the stuff I didn't know. And people were coming in and telling me about like Janet Jackson's marketing plan. I was like, what's a marketing plan? So I got became curious about everything. And, and I was hearing words like they shipped a hundred thousand. What's that mean? Shipped a hundred thousand. Yeah. I, I just became curious about the business and, uh, and I, I think I sort of fell out of love with producing and writing and i was never a great writer kenny was a great writer i was a good producer but kenny was a great writer and i was a collaborator and i filled in some blanks and had some concepts here and there but he was the great writer uh so it was easy to, to sort of step back because i didn't consider myself great at it in the first place i felt my, i felt very lucky so with the the, the label where was that primarily you running the label and face just doing the music or was he involved on the label side as well no i think if you ask him he would say that he's always said that the label was kind of my thing gotcha right uh because i like the idea of signing talent and doing all that stuff you know and picking songs and so for so for a record like a crazy sexy cool where you know babyface is doing uh like a dig it on you or whatever right yes is there no conflict of interest I actually had all of the producers competing and they didn't really know it. <laughs> like I had, I had Dallas working on it first. He was the architect. Then I go play for Jermaine Dupree and be like, I know you could beat this. And then I did his piece. And then I, you know, then Kenny is competitive. You don't have to, you don't have to put a battery in Kenny's back. He's so competitive. So he sent his songs in. And then I went to Rico Wade last and said, here's what everybody else gave me. What you got? And he you came up this. with Waterfalls. Wow. Uh, right. So, uh, and so according to, according to uh, executives at Arista, outside of uh, Outcast, they considered Crazy Sexy Cool my first time as an a and r executive mm -hmm. that i i wasn't the writer i wasn't the producer uh and that was that's and so I, if it was my first i didn't see it that way but if it was i did okay and with I no input cool, from but... i'm sorry like i wouldn't that was, that oh was... and with with no input from clive at all like uh hey, oh maybe. yeah clive, clive not once it was done clive had opinions about the singles and uh, and we had, you know, Creep was the first single. I love Creep, by the way. Mm -hmm. But um, so we shot a video for Creep. Wasn't very good. Huh? It's like, damn. So we shot a second video for Creep. Oh. Again, wasn't very good. I'm like, fuck, now I'm in Wait, trouble. Wait, what? Yeah, we shot two videos and they weren't good. The, the, the world never saw them. Yeah. And so I was embarrassed. So I switched singles. I said, Creep's no longer the single. We're going to go with this song called Kick Your Game that Jermaine Dupri did. Oh, Clive was like, hold it, hold it, hold it. Why are you changing singles? What is this? What's behind this? You have to explain, right? And Dallas Austin called like, yo, I know you're not like not putting my single out. Like he knew he had a great record. Uh -huh. And so I had to come clean and say, well, truth be told, like I made two horrible videos and I'm just too embarrassed to tell everybody. <laughs> so Clive says, get it right. He said, get it right. So... I'm sitting with Diddy one day at the uh, at the Helmsley Palace Hotel in New York. I'm sitting with Diddy. I play him the TLC video that's not good. And he looks at me and it's like, oh my God, like, oh, this is horrible. <laughs> and he I don't he does not make me feel any better about it, right? <laughs> but while I'm showing him the video on one television, 
because I used to have this road case that I carried around with speakers and monitor mm -hmm. and everything like office in a case. I was extra. While I'm playing it for him on the television, there's a video with um, In Vogue and Salt and Pepper called What a Man, What a Man. Mm -hmm. And Matthew. I look at that video. It looks way better than our video. I'm like, who directed that? It's Matthew, Matthew Ralston. Yeah. So I called Matthew Ralston and I asked him to do uh, creep and we got it right the third time but we threw Man. two videos away to get to, now, to the good one a, i will do anything to find those original videos in a situation like that though when when tlc got to repay the money back do they got to pay for all three of those versions or do they just pay for the one that made it well uh, let's look at it like this we sell 10 million albums okay they don't, okay <laughs> there you go sir uh, i don't okay. know yeah. I, I was, if you want the truth, I don't know. I love it. That's all I wanted to hear. That's, That's how fine. I got my that ass in fine. trouble because I, I didn't know. know. <laughs> like, you know, I'm so busy like you know trying else? to make the great record, and trying to make the great video. I'm, like, I'm spending okay. people's money and not yes. realizing. It, you know, I yo, I'm, I'm seething with anger right now. I love your honesty. I love your honesty. I'm seething with anger because to sit in the Geffen offices and be told your videos are one and done, like there is no going back, like. I can't believe that I'm hearing stories of we Everything didn't like happens the video, for a reason. It's okay. So we'll take Amir. it back and then we'll take it back again. And then we'll right. take it back. I hear Mariah made four videos for Vision of Love. And that's I'm a like, very old school thing, though, man. Like, that's so no, old. but I mean, yeah. it's just our label convinced us that, like, because we hated our videos. And right. like, wow. And you couldn't do anything about it. Yeah. Like, you were stuck. Either yeah. video or no video. Like, Oh my God. I, yeah, those roots videos weren't too memorable. <laughs> That's why I hate making videos. Weird enough. Hey man, that. she's being mean to you. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> your videos are not too memorable. That's mean. Listen. <laughs> you say that. <laughs> the reason that I am here is because I'm the roots largest fan. So I can say a couple of truthful things. I'm here for okay, all right. All right. 94, 95, especially 96, 97 is probably one of the most tumultuous times in black oh, God. exec history yes and you know all right the thing is is that we lived in europe during this time period so we really were sort of out of the literal crossfire you lived in europe at the time we 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 the, the shortest story is that basically we realized richard nichols was was intuitive enough to the, the day that God rest his soul, Kurt Cobain committed suicide. Rich said, the label's going to drop us because by this point, Aerosmith had went to Sony, Guns N' Roses wasn't coming up with another album, and now Nirvana's gone. And literally, like, those three acts and all the billions that they made enabled Geffen to have a black department. Um, and we were their first act, and Rich sort of had the spidey sense that everybody's going to get the ax. So we better just grab our publishing money, run to Europe, get a flat, and then just become like the black version of the commitments, like get a tour bus and just tour all over Europe. So we just lived there for like three years straight working. So we were really, we, we hadn't met none of our peers, none of that stuff. Like we come back to record new albums, see our families. But for the most part, it's like six months touring in Europe and spot dates like all over the United States touring. But for the most part, we had missed a lot of the stories that we heard between like what, what was the trouble brewing between like executives and you just knew, you knew how toxic that environment was. How frightening was it being a black executive? And more important, how did you avoid getting sucked into just the, the the toxicness of it all, where it's a great question. Beef is now like a regular thing between executives, you know. Yeah, um, that's a great question, and I have to tell you, like I was really concerned. I was really concerned about it, and because I was, I was very close to Puffy. Right. And I helped start Bad Boy. You know, I get help help get him the deal for Bad Boy. And very proud of that, by the way. Um, 
because I actually wanted him to be an A and R guy at the face. And after one meeting, I realized that this is this is nobody's employee. This guy's a, this guy <laughs> special, you know. Right. Uh, and um, and and I was yeah, I was concerned about it, man, because I felt I felt like I felt Atlanta wasn't the east or the west so we were kind of we weren't viewed as the competition for either the east or the west right whatever we were doing in atlanta even though like we were we were we were having hits but culturally the impact of the west coast was really huge right with snoop and Trey and Pac and all of that and then the bad boy on the east coast those things were like very front-facing and what we did at LaFace wasn't as front facing, like our artists were, but Kenny and I weren't like that. We weren't, well, we weren't as rah rah. Yeah, yeah, there was right. no chain. There was no, you know, we weren't like that, you know. So, but I can only imagine that the more success you got, the more it put you out front to become sucked into that. Cause yeah. I don't think, I don't think that there would be a bad boy death row thing if Puffy were releasing records produced by me. I mean, not to be self-deprecating, but I'm just saying that obviously there's a competition thing on what label is going to wind up on top. And right. you're actually selling more units than both those labels, at least for their right. artists alive. Right, you know? right, right. So, um, I mean, you could have been an easy target. I don't thought I was avoiding it, man, as best I could. And I knew everybody. I mean, I seriously so you had knew relations everybody. with Shook and you have relationship with yes. Puffy and yes, yes. And um I did I didn't know I, I did not know Biggie and I did not know Tupac, right? I never I can't say I knew either of them. I probably had a one handshake with each person and in a in a sort of passing, but I didn't know them. Um and uh, but I yeah, so I have I tried hard, and I won't kid you, I am nobody's tough guy. I tried desperately to avoid ever being in the room. Yeah. Like I wouldn't even go to. So the would fights. you go to Jack the Rappers and all those things? Before I would, but uh, there was a were time they important? When, was that important to go to, or was that just a vanity thing? Uh, Not a vanity was, thing, but you know what? It was important because all all the DJs were there. Like all the DJ and at that time, DJs could make a decision about which records they played, right? Before before the conglomerates took over, you know, yeah. DJs had some say. They had a say in what they played. And, and so we did, and all of the labels uh competitors were there. You got a chance to see what the other label had, what they had coming. And if you needed to go back and do better or find another song or find another act. So and it was it was good camaraderie it was really good until it wasn't when it got bad it got bad and and that's when I stopped going you know but I just tried to avoid it man and, and just stay to myself as much as I could and trying to sort of diminish my presence as, as crazy as that sound right I didn't want to be you know we didn't even have photo we didn't take pictures of nothing we just stayed in the background as much as we could was there was there an act that you kind of purposely passed on signing just because like uh uh this might cause smoke for the label or probably like I don't remember a name, but I I didn't actively look for artists in New York and LA. <laughs> I didn't. I really <laughs> didn't. I didn't. I ain't even gonna lie, right? I did not actively look. And so I was getting Chattanooga, Tennessee, Atlanta, Georgia, you know, you, you know what I mean? Uh, Des Moines, Iowa. I was, Wait, I was, I was, speaking of Chattanooga, Tennessee, can we finally settle this once and for all? We had Usher on the show. We had Tevin Campbell on the show. Can you please tell us <laughs> the Can What's We can Talk we story? Talk right, right. No, I saw, I saw, I saw what, uh, I saw what Tevin said. Um, I never had a say in that because Kenny wrote that song and he produced it on Tevin Campbell and that was it. Like, there was never like a conversation, like, should we give it to Usher or should I, there was never a conversation. Kenny and I uh, were not working as writer, producer partners at that moment. That, that he did completely on his own. 
and gave it to Tevin. Tevin sang the hell out of it, uh, and it worked. So there, there was never any back and forth. So you never had a a uh, Dick Griffey moment where like the face gave a song to someone that you know you could have used that song for your artist and it's like yo come on dog like i could have used that i asked you last week if you had something for tlc and you said no <laughs> no no it wasn't really like that um and i was also very clear about kenny's ambitions as a writer right kenny wanted the greatest artist possible to sing his songs and it wasn't about it, for him, it was never about whether it was on the face or whether it was on Arista or Epic or he never thought about it that way. He thought about it as um, like the song Girlfriend that Pebbles got. The reason she got it is because he thought her voice was the right voice for the song. It was originally for Vanessa Williams. Mm -hmm. Right. And he thought he said it's not right for Vanessa because he listened to. As a, as a musician, as an artist, as a writer, producer, he listened to the voices and he made his decisions based on the voices. And how do you argue with that? You know? I get it. All right, so take in an artist that's sort of not off kilter, um, but there's definitely a big difference between the pink that's signed to LaFace uh, first few records and the artist that she morphed into. So how what's what's the what's the conversation in the metamorphosis where you know there's a beginning and then there's definitely a separation from what mm -hmm. she was and you were you're part of that process so like yes. at what point do you realize maybe I should loosen the strings somewhat and see where they go with it right so first album she did that album as a member of the group choice and then they disbanded and we continued the process. And some of the songs that were made for choice, she kept them. And, but we struggled in the beginning. We really struggled because she was still growing. She was very young and she was still finding herself, finding her style. And so we, the first album we did the best we could do, right? It was called Can't Take Me Home. Loved her concepts, loved her, how she thought about it. And I loved her voice and her energy. She was incredible. Musically, it was a little bit undefined and all over the place. Um, when it got to, so, but we had we had a hit with, um, with There You Go. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and she had a second hit called Most Girls. Not as big a hit, but it did really well. So when it came to her second album, um, she hooked up with Dallas Austin. Uh, her and KP basically oversaw it. Um, and then she hooked up with Linda Perry. And when she first brought it to me, I was like, wait a minute, you're abandoning like the urban thing that you started on your first album. Are you sure about that? And she was like, yeah, I'm not trying to repeat that. I'm on to something really special. And I was like, ah, okay, I don't know. <laughs> and I was like, I'll tell you what, if you feel passionately about it, I'm going to step back, do your thing, right? Uh, and my exact words to her were, because I was, a, I, I got this from Dick Griffey. I said, I'm going to give you an opportunity to fail. Not for updating yourself, okay. Yeah. I said that, and uh, I didn't even really know what it meant, but I said it because Dick Griffey said it. Anyway, um, <laughs> and so she did it. She came back, and she played me Get the Party Started, 18-Wheeler, and she played me all those songs, and I was like, oh, my God, this girl's made a, she made a real album. Mm -hmm. uh, and we went, went, went to work, hooked her up with Dave Myers. They made a great video. And she was off to the races. After that, when it came to her third album, um, I wasn't involved at all. I wasn't mm -hmm. involved at all. She got a new manager, Roger Davis, very famous manager who also manages Tina Turner. Yeah, Roger and Davis. Roger yeah. Davis. And so her and Roger kind of, they did it all and just turned it in. Like I wasn't involved at all. And when it was done, I didn't think it was particularly good honestly. And, um, and I left the company right as it was time to release it. So 
uh, and it didn't do that great. Um, I don't understand when LaFace just amalgamates into Arista, but do I recall when you actually went back to school? I did. Okay. Well, yeah. I so, wanted to know this because Swiss did the same thing. Like, what is this? Yeah, I did. So I, um, so what happened is I got contacted by the Bertelsmann, the company that owned Arista. BMG. Yeah. Mm -hmm, BMG. The head of BMG visited me, came to Atlanta, visited me. This was early too, man. This was like probably 94, 94. And that early on, they said, we would like to, we want you to prep yourself because at some point we want you to take over Arista Records. And I was like, yeah, right. Right. That's what I thought to my, I, I didn't even believe it. 94. Okay. So a couple of years go by and they call again. And instead, this time they don't say Arista. They said, we would like for you to go back to school. We'd like you to go to school. We can get you enrolled in a program at Harvard. You'll have to go and stay on campus. You got to stay for 10 weeks. You cannot run the company. You can't talk to your artists. You can't talk to your executives. You can talk to your family, <laughs> but we need you on the campus and we need you to put in 50 to 60 hours a week doing uh, case studies and living on the campus and really studying um, uh, international business. Wow. Okay. It's like a jail sentence. I like the idea of it because I didn't go to college and I regret it not going to college because I, I opted to be a musician. I opted to go on the road. That was college to me. So I liked this idea. So I went and I stayed there for my 10 weeks and um, it was really hard because it was really, really hard. So I got kids on campus to tutor me uh, and help me get through it. And I made friends with other people in the, in, that were in my in my dorm. Uh, so it was like the students were teaching each other. So you really had to go to Harvard and stay at Harvard and do, you had to do that. Yeah. I lived on campus. Yeah. I lived and on campus. Like the, Black was, Rodney Dangerfield. Was, yeah. I lived on campus and I'm, a, and at this point, like I'm a, I, I live in Atlanta. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a musician, half musician, half executive, you know, I'm a hybrid. I'm a very weird hybrid. I don't know how to dress. I don't know how to walk. I don't know how to talk. I don't know which handshake to use. I'm like completely confused. I'm a fish out of water. And I'm, and and in the greatest institution in the world, apparently. Right. Uh, so it was very intimidating. Everybody seemed so smart. I mean, the accents and, you know, when you hear when you hear when you hear guys with Indian accent talking about EBITDA, it sounds smarter, you know, or guys from the UK, <laughs> they always sound smarter than we do, right? Um, right. So it's just all very intimidating. And then I found my groove right, right around halfway point. I started to find my groove and, and, and figured it out. And at the end of it, I graduated and I didn't know if I would. What were some of the things you learned from that program? Like, how did that? We really that? studied businesses. We studied Things like things that you would love, like we studied decisions that Phil Knight made to make Nike a success. We discovered, gotcha. you know, things like that, like and we would take it in steps like they would present us a case. They would show us the, the dilemma or where the company could go one way or another. And then they would test us basically, basically like what decision would you make here? Um, and then we would go to the next sort of chapter of the story. Um, and it was just basically case studies, studying each person's case, not only in entertainment but or, or, or in apparel, but everything from public utilities to you know hospital to grocery stores to um, automotive, Toyota, uh, to Disney. We studied, we studied businesses. Did you study, okay, so um, there's of course a famous book out now called the Harvard Report, where they first did a, a case study of Clive Davis um, yes. embracing black music. Were they still using that book as a- No, a we, didn't, we never got there, but they have so many. Like they, they, collect case, they collect case studies from all over the world. 
and each professor would select the cases that he wants to use in uh, in his classrooms. Um, but there's no there's no set stories. I knew about the Clive, and uh, they actually did one with me uh, about uh, it was like the study of black music, right? Um, and um, they did. I know a lot of people that they've actually done the reports. They don't publish them all. They don't actually uh, use them all. But they just basically collect information, and 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 they teach it. And and it's good. The way we went about it, like it was intimidating at first, uh, until I got my groove and realized that there were things I knew that some of the people in the room they didn't did. know. Yeah, Once I got that confidence, I was like, okay, because uh, they study in business, but you've been running one. Yes. <laughs> Okay, I have one confessions question. I kind of consider confessions the end of the parenthesis of whatever. I mean, I, I really can't tell like what the first mega album, maybe Carol King's Tapestry was right. like one of the first mega selling records. Um, but, you know, Usher's Confessions comes at a time when streaming culture is about to uh confuse the whole entire industry uh, where buying a tangible okay. record is a vote so this is kind of a a, a a part one and part two thing um one did you realize at the time when 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 confessions was said and done did you realize then that there will never be another uh uh mega selling album of this nature wow. again in the music business Wow. No, I didn't think of that's incredible that you should say that. But no, yeah, well, I didn't... Confessions is the like after that, then that's the last that's the last like diamond album. Yes, literally, because after that streaming comes in and ruins it. But I, I, was, I was asking that only because of his Atlanta roots. I always wanted to ask a CEO at least what their feelings of what streaming was threatening to be. And of course, you know, there, there's the, the Napster situation that sort of confused people and had them in their feelings and then accepting iTunes and whatnot, even down to uh, DJ Drama's arrest. Like, can you talk about what the what the at least the scary environment for what music was about to become? Now, somehow you managed to. Well, there's. On yeah, but there's there was a, but... there was a piece in between that, which was downloads, and downloads while they weren't physical, yeah. were still a la carte. They were still like sales. Um, so the next the next chapter of successes were measured through downloads, right? Uh, some physical, not that much, you know. But uh, CDs were dwindling badly. Vinyl was completely out of out of the count. Uh, and downloads were the thing. So we still had. But as president, did you feel the pressure that I got to figure out something quick? Like all my record, all my label, like my artists are went from 10 million to now to sell 3 million is an achievement. Although it's um, not your fault per se, it's just right, the time right. going. Yeah. How, so how are you dealing with that as a CEO, like and as an executive? Yeah, the idea was just to not bottom out. The idea was, yes, the sales are dwindling and it, it's across the board. It's not one company that's dwindling. It's not one artist that's, that sales are dwindling. The entire industry is going down the tube. Napster's introduced uh, the download. Uh, so we're fighting piracy at a, at a rate that we've never had to fight piracy, at least that we know of. Um, so with that being the reality, it was just get the best artists and the best records you can and do the best you can. And I never really measured it against, like, I didn't even know that fact. I didn't know that Confessions Light was maybe the last diamond. I didn't even know that. Confessions and Speaker Box yeah. were the last of the movie. The last. Like, so I didn't even realize that. So I didn't, I didn't, in my mind, compete with it. I didn't think of it that way. I thought of it more as um, meaningful bodies of work, like, which I felt Kanye made as an example, right? Um, and I was really proud of everything for the time I was around him. I was proud of those records and I felt that they were, I felt they measured up to whatever we did at 
with Outcast, whatever we did with Usher. And I also had like Mariah Carey's Emancipation of Mimi, Emancipation right? Mimi. And that felt like the, for me, that felt like um, the follow-up to Confessions. Right. Some of the same kind of sounding records. That's how I looked at it. But I didn't look at the sales and I didn't look at the, the challenge that we had as an industry uh, as a threat. I looked at it more as, yes, we need to figure this out. And, um, and well, once you come to Def Jam, like you kind of have to start all over again. Like, what is it to meet your, oh. especially coming from where they came from, as far as like the, the, the era of Julie and, and uh, Leor. Right. Leor, yeah. Like to come in there and to be the new guy, like, was it oh, dealing it was crazy. with side eyes and no? Oh my God, there? man, it was crazy. It was, it was, was crazy. crazy it was nice to you. Crazy wasn't there when I got there. Okay. She came once, once Jay was president. Right. Uh, but man, it was, uh, it was scary because it was a real, first of all, I didn't realize here's the thing about Def Jam. Like if you're a part of that culture, you realize how important that culture is. If you're not a part of it, you don't really know. So as crazy as this sounds, I didn't know that it was what it was like it wasn't that to us in atlanta i mean it was a successful company it was big we respected it. we knew russell we knew rick rubin we knew lira cohen we knew chris lighty we knew ll cool j we knew it but we didn't think of it as the institution that it was we didn't see it that way uh so when i walked in i was shocked by i was shocked by it all i was shocked by the voice of the community and their opinions about anything that happened. I didn't realize that but Def Jam belonged to the streets. It belonged to the people. Like, you know, it Funk Master Flex had a say in it. Every, I'm just making up names, anybody, right? Everybody had a say in it. So when I came in as, as a new chairman of the company, coming from my background, I was immediately made to feel uncomfortable, right? Um, executives were taking out articles in the newspaper and in billboard magazines talking about how I wasn't fit for it and how, you know, how would I know how to go talk to DMX? Like, you know, it was, it, it, and, and I felt it. I really did. I felt it. And how long and before I, you got your, your, I didn't feel welcome group. at all. Um, and I love Julie. I think she's one of the most remarkable executives in the world. I love Kevin. I think he's one of the most remarkable executives in the world. Neither of them made me feel welcome. And and uh, oh wait, so they Kevin and Julie were still there when yes. you came? Yes. Oh, I, I kind of thought they all left together. Yeah, they they were there when I got there. Uh only Leor had left. Um and I didn't feel very welcome, right? And um I get it. And I didn't feel welcomed by uh, the artist either. The artist at that time, you know, um, I I loved the, I loved them, right? Method Man, Red Man, Ghostface, LL Cool J. Right. Um, uh, the only one, and Jay Z was like on semi retirement, right? At Rockefeller, and the artist that embraced me was Kanye West. Wow, that was the one that embraced me. Right? So that helps. So, <laughs> that helped a lot. And this is early Kanye before he released his first album, right? Uh, although it was already done and slated to be released when I came to the company. But uh, I met him and he said to me, because you understand Outkast, you'll probably understand me. And that's how that was the first conversation we ever had. And, and I locked in with him. And then Mariah called. And because her and I wanted to work together for years, I tried to sign her at Arista when she first left Sony. And um, so I had Mariah um, embracing me, but no one else. So Mariah says, I'm on the phone with Mariah. This is really good. And she says, you know how you can put the fire out? I was like, how? She said, make Jay-Z the president. <laughs> oh, that was your well Oh man, no. That was Mariah. That was her fault. Her fault. Shut and up, I was Mariah. Like, Mariah. Oh, <laughs> you don't like that idea? 
No, well, I, you asking she's, the wrong person. I'm kind of overprotective. I'm being. I was me. too. I was way overprotective of the roots. I had a whole conversation with Jay on the radio about the way he was handling his presidency and the way he was handling all the Philadelphia acts at the time. So no, as a radio person and for the Philadelphia person, I was not feeling that. But the artist, he's great. Oh yeah. Okay. Anyway, but but, but you know what? When I when I so Mariah put the idea in my head. Mm-hmm. I presented it to Jay. Didn't get an answer um right away eventually we were able to come to terms and he became the president of Def Jam and at that point that made the peace and everybody left me alone um and <laughs> wow. but method, but method so man something... wasn't happy Ghostface that's, wasn't happy. that's that's <laughs> something I that's something I did not know wow yeah and I and and a lot of the artists, like I, I met a few artists that that have said to me that they, because it's a two way street. When you become, you're the head of a label and you come in to an established company, you're auditioning for them. Mm-hmm. It's not right. the other way around. It's not the artists need to prove to you. It's you need to right. prove to the artists, right? Right. Right. And and many of the artists were like, we're not even going to give you a chance because a a we think you might be R and B. B we think you pop. Either way, we don't think you're hip hop. So I might be coming to your office, right? So um, so that was a very difficult thing. And I, and I was like, yo, okay, I hear y'all. I still have the biggest selling hip hop album of all time. Do yeah. I get a do I get do I get a a, a meeting? Because <laughs> y'all ain't beat the speaker box enough below yet. So can I at least get a meeting? <laughs> you know, um, I can't even believe that you would have to beg for a meeting. That's crazy. I, I, I was not embraced. It's okay though. Like I'm not saying that like I was no. I was cool. Uh and I just embraced those that embraced me. And we and we ended up we created a different kind of label. As Chris Lighty, may he rest in peace, loved him. He said, This is uh La Face Jam. This is not Def Jam. <laughs> wow. Oh, wow. So speaking wow. of an unusual. If only Def, Def Soul artist. was still there. He would have got huh? I said, so I said if only Def Soul had been still alive oh, by the time on. he had got that. Uh, okay. One one very unusual Def Jam signee at the time that I, I considered. Can you talk about what it took to market and break uh Justin Bieber out? Oh, yes. So I love that. That was a um, that was that was a gift from Usher, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Usher came in. He said, "I have a gift for you." Came in. I thought he was going to bring me cigars or wine it. or something. I love this story. I love Human this story. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> of white men. I love it. That was a gift. Yes. And he walks in with fourteen-year-old Usher. I mean, a fourteen-year-old Justin Bieber. Justin comes in, comes in, and he's beating on the table, right? And he's playing the piano, he's playing the guitar, and he's singing, he's jumping around, he's talking, he's a mile a minute, and I'm just staring at him like, "This star, like, it, I mean, I got my star hat on. I'm like, this is a, this dude is mm-hmm. a star. I'm telling you guys, I thought I, I ain't gonna lie, I thought I met Elvis." Wow. Wow. I seriously, I was like, this dude right here. And 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 because the girls all talked about how pretty his face was. And not not pretty like in a negative way, but in a in a way that they loved him, right? All the girls loved him. Mm -hmm. And then artists, the not all artists, but many artists like kind of liked him. And um so we we went about making the record and um the first record. With strategy, you want to do strategically. I have this theory that Blue Eyed Soul is the music that has the greatest opportunity for global success. That's Go. my that's my opinion. Yeah. Uh, and um, so we put him on black radio. First thing out, put him on V103 in Baby Atlanta. Baby was, that's, wow. That's where it started. He had a song called One Time Before Baby. Okay. And we put and we put it on V103 and and we that's what we did man we we went black first. Mm-hmm. And then that we worked. put it on rhythm and then we crossed it over but we wanted to we wanted to give him uh some black foundation and he had and he was in and he was he had the check the endorsement because of Usher, oh, Usher. and me. Yeah. So he had real and 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 Dream and Tricky were making his records. Yeah. So he had he was covered 
which he could have went the other way because wasn't it a battle between Usher and was it Justin? Justin they Timberlake. Yes, yeah. they him. Was. They both yeah. wanted him. Was they both wanted him? And and then and after that, uh, then Kanye embraced him. You know, and it, it just kind of worked out. Everyone fell in line. Break everybody else. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna slowly wind this down. Okay. And we, I can't believe that at this point. Oh my God, this. Uh, this yeah. is like the old school. Not it's near yeah, four we're hours. Yeah, we're knocking on four. I mean, at this rate where you've worked at labels and whatnot, do you believe in the theory that I hear people say all the time, like, it's going to be the end of labels, no more labels. If it is going to be the end of labels, what will happen to music next? Because I do feel like something is going to eventually give. Hmm. Like, I yeah. feel like this, this decade that we're in, the 20s, everything is giving. So should music follow suit? Are you, I don't, pre- are I don't. you prepared to aid in the next step of it? Or is it sort of like, all right, I've 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 done my bit. I'm going to sit out. Uh, I'm definitely not done. <laughs> First okay. of all, I ain't sitting out. Nothing, man. They got to, they got, yo, know, they tried to take my head off. I still got my head. So sorry. Mm. I'm, um, mm. So, so. I don't believe in that. I think that labels have historically not been well loved, well liked, and for a lot for 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 the right reasons probably. But throughout time, people have not late record labels do not have a great public perception, no matter what it is. No matter you know culturally maybe so like people like Def Jam or people like Bad Boy or, or Motown or whatever, right? But culturally, it may have. A lot of impact, but the public perception are that record companies are generally um, um, Brooks. N- not upstanding people, right? Uh, so people have always wanted to see the demise of record labels. I think that, and so now we live in an era of independence, right? Where, and that's good in that, and there's bad in that, right? The, the bad in that is that. There is no barrier to entry. There is no filter. So everything is out. Everything is on Spotify. Everything is on Apple. Everything is on SoundCloud. Everything, everything. Like there's no filter for it, right? And and so we're now we're leaving it to the the edit the editorial people uh, the, or the music editors to make the decisions about which songs are good enough to be on the world's biggest playlist but they're picking from 60,000 a day right. okay. I like it I, so I don't I don't see that as I don't see that as great right um at all because I like the idea that tastemakers curators of music passionate music people make decisions about what they love based on their experiences and those things get a shot not that the other things shouldn't get a shot Mm -hmm. but i don't like the idea that it's a free-for-all and 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 i think that there's a fallacy there that you can be chance the rapper and you can be independent and make it all the way to the top but as I understand it, he's probably got 50 like employees and a lot of money and all kinds of stuff. That's not exactly the same thing as being just a starving kid in Columbus, Ohio, who wants to be independent, right? That's not the yeah, same he thing. Has, he has money. Back. Not if but, your parents are friends with Obama. Right. So, 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 so if you're a kid, you if you're a 15 year old kid in Columbus, Ohio, and you don't have a record label, and you're told to do it on your own, man, you don't know what to do. You do not know what to do, right? So that means that you're going to, you're going to put your music out. It might get wasted. You're going to waste a lot of time. You're going to get inc- discouraged. And we might actually not see the next star because you've been discouraged before you get an opportunity to come out of the gate. Whereas if someone embraces you and put their arm around you and says, you know, I believe in you. And oh, by the way, I'm leaving out something very important. Mm-hmm. You're you're a, a, a highly trained, wildly successful, m- massively talented musician. And you respect people who put the time in that you put in, whether you like their music or not like their music. You respect the fact that or all of you guys are, are seasoned executives and seasoned professionals and you respect people who do. 
there's something to be said for the people who are just doing it as a hobby, who aren't serious, who aren't yeah. as serious as you are, who aren't as talented as you are, who aren't, who, who haven't been challenged the way you have, who have never been on stage, right? There's something to be said for the fact that we need the music infrastructure to tr as a training ground. We, right. Somebody needs to know what it's like. I mean, as, that's so anyway, my feelings about it are I'm very passionate. So how do we get it, back? Do we get do we get back? It's not it's, it's not actually or, gone. Okay. Record labels make more money than they ever made. Huh. Is that true? That's interesting. They don't that's not absolutely true. Record that's labels make made. more money than they ever made. Because I true I truly thought that. Record labels were kind of on Me too. No, def a defibrillator status. Uh, yeah. No, bro. Record labels stand. are killing it. Universal music is 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 worth over fifty billion dollars, bro. A music company. I'm not talking about film or TV or tech. I'm talking about music content that you created. Right. <laughs> But but right. Universal at this point owns so many properties in that way, right? Like not any, it's not as many individuals. I mean, they they've, been, they've been gobbling up labels for years. But the right. point is that like they are making an abs. The record labels are making an absolute fortune. Okay. An absolute fortune, uh, and I don't begrudge it. It's beautiful, you know. Um, I wish I was right there getting bonuses right now. I'm, I'm not mad at it. But <laughs> the point, the right. The point of it is that the infrastructure hasn't died. It takes a record label to say, okay, hey, Lil Nas X, that's an example. Lil Nas X, came, he comes out with his Old Town Road. It becomes some kind of a phenomenon, independently, by the way. It gets picked mm. up by a major label. This is an artist, like him or not, this is an artist that has a massive creative vision, right? And, and it needs to have the kind of financial support yeah. that he can, he, he can get that off. He can't do that independently. Those ideas are too big. Honestly, those ideas and those yeah. ideas are very expensive. Otherwise, we get a we get a fraction of who this artist could be. If he wasn't signed to Columbia Records, I'm saying that he would be a success, but he'd be a fraction of the artist that he could be because now he has the infrastructure to really get it off. And that's and what I like. And he's the artist that fits in that mold. I mean, for me, when I talk to young artists coming up. My thing is just if you're going to sign to a label, if you're going to do that, my advice is if you're going to do it, you might as well play big. You might as well swing for the fences. Like That's the only no reason need. to do it. That's the only reason. If you just want to, if you're just truly an independent person, not just as a label, but just as a creator, you know what I mean? If you just want to look, I just want to do my shit when I feel like it, put it out when I feel like it. Great. But a major label is not for you. Like, that's not what that is. Yeah, it's and, not um, for everybody. Uh, but to me, the game is not for everybody. I, that's what I'm trying to say is that it's not for everybody. And it shouldn't be so easy to get in. It's hard. It takes it's harder. To, you can't just get in the NBA because you like basketball. It's, right. But is mean, it more gray than what you're saying? Can it be some gray in between what you're saying and what's going on right now? Is there more gray than your? Maybe, possibly, possibly. Okay. I'm open. I'm open-minded. So okay. that's okay. quite possible. Okay. <laughs> but what I'm, but but what I'm, what what I am, what I am, uh, a, a strong advocate of is, are you serious about the game? Are you serious about this? Because Ooh, shoot. Like, I, I don't like the idea. Like this is not this is not for hobbyists. Serious don't mean what it used to mean. Serious. I don't know, mean. and that bothers me. Right? Areas don't mean trade, reading your trades so, and reading all your, your books. It don't, it don't. But are you the last of the Mohicans? Like, I know there's you. I know there's Sylvia. I don't know if Doug Morris is still in the game or not, but, you know, like someone else is running. I don't know who's running Def Jam now, but someone uh, that. It's, it's not Tunji, Tunji, my man Tunji. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Tunji's running Def Jam? Yes, and he's really <laughs> talented. Yes. And. And yeah. I'm I'm happy. I'm proud. I will support and uh -oh. promote and and do anything. He is really talented, and he's about that music. He's about culture. He's bringing African culture into the country with yes, Afrobeats. Yes. Right. He's looking forward, and and he's doing it based on talent. He's doing yes. it based on qualification, and and he's not just looking at, at at data and saying I should sign this because it's streaming. He's looking at the, and he's he's listening to the music. And he did it with. Ooh, it was very much, it very much reminded me his trajectory was very much like you in the sense that Keep Cool was like his La Face. So to yeah, speak. absolutely. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then, you know, he came and they brought him in to run Def yeah. Jam. So, yeah. Shout out yeah. to Sanjay. By the way, that, if it was me, 
as a music curator, now Def Jam is the perfect place. Man. Well, guess what? <laughs> we, you know, you know the thing where like, I, I, I don't know the movie or the, or the sitcom example of like, when you think you're, you're like, that's your last statement and you like burn the house down or like you're the father like, and I'm leaving the family and you leave and then you come back cause you forgot your keys. Uh, it, we just got reminded by Def Jam. Oh, by the way, I remember what we said, but you guys actually do owe us one more record. So it's like, Fuji. I think this is a great thing because because I think yeah. that I I a I know that he loves you. I know that he loves the roots and and understands it. I, I love and it's also man. possible that he might make a suggestion or two that you might like. Right about. Try this yeah. or try that, right? I think it's that to me. Literally, all of his signings, I feel like, are the Roots' grandchildren. So yes, oh, I, oh children, they are. That's what I'm trying to say. That's exactly yes. what I'm trying to say. Right. That that one to me, you know, as, as someone you didn't ask, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's <laughs> that works. I got it. Uh, look, bro, bro, right. brother Reed, before we, 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 before we, we literally go, we gotta oh, go. go before we, go, before we go, man, I know you gotta go. I just wanted to say this, man. You played a very, and I'm so happy we're having this chance to have this conversation. Uh, you played a part in my career that I'm sure you have no idea if you did, but um, this is back in like 2007. You had a group on your on Dev Jam Play Circle that they were through DTP. It was a city, of course, city what, yeah, yeah, city of and course. Dollar. And so, um, my man Denon Porter shot him, he hit me to do some records. He was like, yo, man, I'm burnt out. I need just some hook ideas, whatever. And I was like, all right, cool, whatever. So I just referenced a couple hook ideas for him and sent them off. And I didn't think nothing else of it. And so the song that I did, it was a song called Paper Chaser. And I just sang it as a reference. And so the joint ended up, I didn't find out until like later that the song actually made the record. And so I ran into uh, Titty and Dollar. We was at BT Boys in 07. And uh, me and Dollar was talking, and he was like, oh, my God. He was like, I was like, yo, I'm Fonte, man. He was like, oh, yo, what's up? And I'm like, what the hell? And he said, man, the thing with that record, he said, we sent it in. And he said, we was thinking about, like, getting Akon on it, because, you know, Akon was going up at that time. He was like, we was thinking about getting, like, Akon or somebody went on it. He said, but L.A. Reid was like, yo, who's the dude that's singing on it? I like him. Just, it sound good like that. Just keep it. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I just want to incredible. say thank you LA so much. Style. That really... That really put, uh, yeah, it really gave me just a, a lot of confidence and belief. I'm like, yo, this dude. A battery in your pack. Fucking- Woo! Oh, I'm- man, I was like, yo. Like, that's great. That's- so, nah, just thank you. Thank you so much for that, man. That really meant a lot. Thank that's you. That's great. I'm so happy to hear that. Well, Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I time. appreciate this yeah. uh, on behalf of Fonte. Oh, oh hey, real quick. Thank you for putting out Splack of Valley by pressure. Yeah. And <laughs> 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 hey, by the way, Amir, you are yeah. like you, like you're the dopest dude in this business, man. Like, just that's got. I just, I really love and appreciate you, man. Like, you, you just, yeah, you make me proud to be a part of this thing. Well, I, I think you, you represent us well, and I yes. appreciate you for not not dropping me on my birthday. I'll, I'll never forget. <laughs> I, I think. By the way, I don't think that's the truth, but I'm gonna let you have it. Right. That probably was Rich trying to get him to finish some shit. Some, that was what that was. Whatever. I don't even know how you do that. Hey, <laughs> I called you on my birthday. I remember that. Listen, I remember that. But on anyway. Behalf of, on behalf of Unpaid Bill and Sugar Steve. Sorry, Steve. We once again hogged all your questions. It's all good. I've been reading my uh, recent episode of Black Beat Magazine the whole time. Yeah, you tapped, you tapped out on me, Sugar. Sugar. You tapped out on me, but it's all good. <laughs> All right, on behalf of Laia and Fontigolo and the great L.A. Reed, this is yes. Plus Love Supreme, and uh, we'll see you on the next go-round. <laughs>